My name is Daniel Taylor. I am going into my senior year at Catholic University and I'm studying mechanical engineering. The summer, like the rest of you, I've been able to, uh, been privileged enough to work with MIRI and uh, the National Science Foundation um, on uh, some really cool research. Um, so my project is on computing ground motion intensity at soil liquefaction sites. Um, so first, a little bit of uh, an introduction here. Uh, what is soil liquefaction? Why is it a problem for buildings and infrastructure? How can we understand it? And why do we need to study this? So soil liquefaction um, is an occurrence that, that happens when earthquakes Earthquakes happen and they shake the ground. Everyone knows that. They shake the ground and when there's a lot of water in the soils, um, the, the soil particles can slide past each other very easily. And if there's huge basins full of soil and they're also full of water underneath, they're shaking back and forth, something can happen called liquefaction when the, the soil starts to liquefy. Um, if, if, you, if you can imagine that you take a bucket fill it with sand, pour a bunch of water in it, drop a Lego on top and you shake it back and forth, your Lego is going to sink into the ground. So it's kind of bad for buildings and infrastructure. If you can imagine you have a building on the surface of the, of the ground, your <clears throat> soil starts to liquefy, your buildings sink in, that's what's really dangerous. Here's a picture of a road that got a little destroyed by some liquefaction. Um, so how can we understand this more? Um, one big thing is start starting to understand the parameters that um, go into um, that, that really caused the, caused the liquefaction. Um, a good way to do that is to measure um, data, collect data. Um, why do we understand this more? Um, increased infrastructure safety. You can calculate safety factors better for buildings. Um, you can understand that, okay, in this region, if we know that liquefaction is gonna occur at half a G of acceleration, then we're gonna need to build with a safety factor of two. And that way our, uh, our building will be safe if, if a stronger earthquake happens, et cetera. Um, so a little bit of uh, background here. Here's an example of liquefaction damage. This is from the Chichiki Taiwan earthquake um, in 1999. As you can see, that building's pretty, pretty destroyed. Uh, here's a little bit of background. So um, in the geotechnical engineering community, there's been a lot of uh, pushes towards understanding liquefaction and uh, really trying to understand it better because it, there are so many influencing parameters that um, make it tricky to really get, a, get a, an understanding. Um, so path methods of, of understanding liquefaction um, have consisted of simple uh, ground interpolations from uh, earthquake epicenter or um, estimations, even estimations of ground motion intensity values at places where soil liquefaction, liquefaction has occurred. So, um, another big thing is pushing for public data repositories. One in, in particular is the Next Generation Liquefaction Database, which is one that uh, we worked on. Uh, it includes a lot of really important and uh, helpful parameters. <clears throat> there are a few of them. Uh, a really important one is ground motion intensity. Obviously, if the ground's not shaking, you probably won't end up with so much liquefaction. Um, another really important one is shear wave velocity at 30 meters depth. That's also called VS30. Um, the VS30 is really important because if you can understand how fast the shear wave is traveling through the ground, um, deep underground, um, you know how, how much um, energy is being transferred to the soil, how much that soil is gonna shake back and forth. Um, so that's a really important one. Those are tested with cone penetration tests, standard penetration tests, and um, that they drill really deep into the ground and see how hard the soil is essentially. Um, some other ones here, soil grain size, density, uh, surface shear stress, is there a building on top? How much water is in the ground? Um, another one. Uh, so this is a little bit of background about ground motion intensity. Um, it's one of the most influential parameters. Uh, it can be measured with accelerometers. A lot of scientists go out into uh, earthquake hotspots and they place uh, accelerometers into the ground and so that if the seismic event occurs they can they could know okay uh, the ground acceleration in all of these locations um, is half a g over here 0.75 over there etc um, so current methods of um, 
predicting ground motion intensity also um, include earthquake modeling. There's a lot, there's a big increase in earthquake modeling, um, which, which really helps to come up with estimations for what ground motion um, values are, uh, acceleration values are at uh, soil liquefaction sites, um, and also doing interpolations. So here's a little bit of uh, background into some of the important calculations. Um, this is the joiner bore distance at the top. And at the top right, you can see um, this is a fault segment in blue. The joiner bore distance is essentially the distance between a site of interest or a station and, and the fault. That's really important because further distances from the fault, you have a diminishing ground acceleration value. So if you have a close uh, or a small RJB, you're gonna end up with a higher um, peak ground acceleration of PGA. Um, we also use residuals. Residuals is essentially the difference between what a model generates and what a true station recording is. Um, those can be used to um, come up with, uh, I guess, uh, location deviances from what a model would really predict. Uh, here's a little bit about frigging interpolation. These are just special algorithms that uh, interpret the weights of specific values in various locations and then um, they can be used to estimate locations in the middle of a field of points or, or neighboring points. Uh, for our uh, project, we've used Jupyter Notebooks, Python 3, and these packages here. One important one was OpenQuake. Uh, that was the um, software that we used for um, running the uh, earthquake models. So for this event of study, uh, we went with uh, Chi Chi Taiwan. Um, I chose Chi Chi because there was a lot of uh, liquefaction data and ground motion recording data available. Uh, so this was actually a pretty rough earthquake. Over 2,500 people died and uh, another 1,100 were injured or something like that. Um, so quite a lot. Um, <clears throat> applied a data-driven approach to compute ground motion intensity. So this is a very important thing, um, sort of combining the effects of modeling and using real-world data. Um, so what we did for our methods here is we uh, start by computing the distances between each of our stations and the fault, computing those RJB values. Then we get the, the uh, shear wave velocity at all of those stations, which are actually recorded in the database. Uh, then we can generate, uh, using our model, we can generate those um, PGA values, peak ground acceleration values for each of the stations. Then we can obtain a residual by comparing the model generated station uh, ground acceleration value to our uh, true recorded value by taking a, a log difference. Um, uh, this is from the previous equation. Then we can uh, generate uh, a Krigging mesh. So um, an important step here is uh, making a variogram. A variogram is essentially, it shows the uh, empirical difference between um, uh, the trends between points and their corresponding dis distances between each other. So a variogram essentially can tell a Krigging algorithm um, at what distances it will be affected. So if it um, tries to uh, in interpolate and understand a value that's um, five kilometers away, um, it may not be effective and it has enough data to understand that. So maybe it'll try to only um, work at within a range of five, five kilometers or whatever. Uh, so um, that's how we use a, a creeping mesh. Uh, we use those residuals at each of the station locations and then input the variogram also. And it gives you a, a you can spit out a 50 by 50 mesh of the whole island. Um, containing all the stations. Um, then you can go back and compute your site PGA values um, by working backwards. You grab residuals from the site locations, not the station locations, but the locations that you want. And using that residual and a model, modeled PGA at that same, that same area, then you can um, calculate back and come up with a, with a new uh, site PGA. Um, so here is a table, um, some of our results. Here's a table of RJB distances. Um, 
for you can see that our our model was uh, actually pretty close. The average um, the average uh, RJV value that our model generated was um, within three kilometers of um, the true station recording that's in the NGL database. Here's a residual map of the island. Um, and you can see towards the north here, there's a, a region of lower residuals. So the, that means the model is under predicting what the true um, PGA value is. Um, here are a couple of barrier models. This is important um, for under or like fitting um, our empirical data set to a model that can be inputted into a printing algorithm. Uh, you can see there's not much correlation here, not much correlation here or there. That's getting a little bit closer. But this one works really well, the matter and variable. Um, on the x-axis, this is uh, the lag, which is essentially the, diff the distance between points, uh, point pairs. And then on the y-axis is um, the increasing uh, deviance from uh, what the true, uh, what the, uh, true value would be. Uh, here's another uh, photo of the plot of the matter and barrier gram that one did for the best and we use that for our, for our plot. Um, here is a trigging mesh of the whole island. You can see areas of larger or, or smaller residual value. And uh, so taking this, say we want to understand at this location right here, what's the, um, what's the PGA value? Well, we're going to need the residual. So using this mesh of residuals, we can grab the residual at this location and say, oh, it's about zero point or negative 0 0.05, something like that. And then we can calculate backwards after modeling the PGA values and calculate what our um, what a what a better PGA value is here. And there here are some of them. Um, so you can see it was pretty close. Um, these are the NGL database GMIM um, ground motion intensity measurement. Um, PGA estimations that scientists have done previously. And so you can see that some of them are uh, pretty close. Um, I just grabbed, grabbed a couple in there. Um, uh, here's another example. Um, <clears throat> on the left, you can see a couple sites. The sites are listed as red hexagons and the stations are uh, yellow triangles. And you can see at this red hexagon over here, the site PGA was calculated to be 0.186 Gs. And on the right, you can see 0.232 Gs um, for this station. So it's in between these two station values, which means that it's working pretty well in interpreting the uh, BS30 values appropriately. So in conclusion, um, this method allows for consistent computation of PGA values. So in the future, our uh, scientists can go out and they can compute um, with one, one algorithm what those PGA values are at liquefaction sites. So they don't, it doesn't have, there won't be deviance from between what one researcher thinks is the ground motion and what another researcher thinks is the ground motion. There's gonna be, there can be one uh, standard, one calculation for, for this. Um, going forward, uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot more that can be done to understand liquefaction and to understand these, uh, these occurrences. And an important thing is um, uh, re remodifying this algorithm for other events. So you can change a couple lines at the top of the top, at the top of the code and you can run it again for any, any event essentially in the database that can be modified for that. Um, so uh, for my acknowledgements, I'd like to thank um, all of you guys, especially, thank you, Robin. And, um, especially my mentors, um, Dr. Brandenburg, um, Dr. Dr. Charlie Day, and um, Kenneth and Tristan. And here are my references. Thank you. If you have any questions, I can take them. Yes. Would like a mesh overlay over like, the actual geolocation? Uh, yeah, yes. So the question was, can you, um, can you model, essentially model the, um, 
risk of liquefaction in certain areas and then plot that as a mesh or over, over a region essentially. Yeah, so going forward, um, we plotted residual maps, um, which can be used to calculate just like PGA values in those locations. But going forward, it can definitely be used to um, used in other models to come up with uh, actual liquefaction risks um, and uh, you use that to, um, you, you could essentially generate a field of liquefaction risk um, over areas. And scientists, I think, have already um, done that. Um, for, for different places. It, a, a lot of them are in California. There's a lot of studies in California because of how um, uh, frequent uh, earthquakes are over there. But yes, you can generate um, meshes over regions of uh, liquefaction risk. Going forward, you, that, that could probably be achieved. I think there would definitely need to be a little more data collection and more, more study, I think, but yeah, achievable. Okay. Hello, my name is Adriana Alonza. Everyone just calls me Audrey though. Uh, this summer, I worked at the Wallowin facility at Florida International University studying wind load and performance of elevated structures. Hurricanes and extreme weather events have been increasing in severity and number in the past couple of years. This is a problem because each of these events can cost billions of dollars in damage to the damage that they cause to public and private infrastructure. Storm surges and flooding, which are caused by the atmospheric changes due to hurricanes and also wind speed, um, are also very concerning to homeowners because of the damage that they cause. So FEMA has been recommending homeowners to elevate their houses to prevent these damages. The problem with this is that elevated structures aerodynamics are different because of the air gap underneath the structure in between the floor and the earth, and also the fact that they're typically taller than conventional structures. Currently, no recommendations um, for wind load on these structures exist. The most recent building code, ASCE 716, has no mention of wind load on elevated housing at all. Um, so it, it's kind of a problem. So reconnaissance surveys after Hurricane Michael showed that um, elevated houses actually experience higher wind damages than typical structures. And that's just because there are no building codes for engineers to look at when designing these houses. So this is just the wind path of Hurricane Michael. Um, it ranges from tropical storm to category five. And you can see that by the red dot, the dark red dot on the Florida Panhandle region, that's where Hurricane Michael um, hit. And that's the region that I'll be talking about now. So, each of these dots is a house that was surveyed in the reconnaissance surveys. Um, the dots range in color from a dark blue to an, around an orangey red. So that's damage state from wind. So damage state zero represents minimal damage, pretty much undamaged or less than 3% of the walls or roof. Damage state one represents minor damage confined to the exterior. Damage state two represents um, some damage to structure but most of the time the structure is still standing overall. Damage state three represents severe damage um, where there, a wall may be collapsed or a roof may have caved in, but overall the structure is still standing and most likely repairable. Damage state four represents com a completely destroyed structure. So it's just not salvageable at all and you have to restart. The reason why I showed you that is I wanna show you this graph here. Um, this is the percent of structures damaged versus their elevation level of the structure. So I'm going to be focusing on columns one and three. Column one is zero foot elevation and column three is six to 8.9 foot feet of elevation. So if we look at zero feet elevation, there's around 8% of the houses that are undamaged or minimally damaged. And for six to 8.9 feet, that number goes down to zero. If we also look at damage states two, three, and four um, on the First column, it's around 60% of houses are within that range of two, three, and four, but that number jumps to almost 90% in column three. So there is something going on with elevated houses experiencing more wind damage than their conventional counterparts. There was also a study in 1994 by Holmes that showed that wind pressures on elevated housing can actually be 40 to 80% higher than conventional houses. This is just because, again, because of that air gap in between the floor and the earth, and also because the wind speed increases with height due to the atmospheric boundary layer. 
The atmospheric boundary layer, or ABL for short, um, this is just a diagram of it. Um, if everyone could please just take a second to rub your hands together. Yeah. So when you do that, your hands should actually heat up. And that's just because of the friction between both of your hands. A similar thing happens when the wind goes over the surface of the earth. So the friction in between the wind and the earth slows down the wind, um, especially in areas with buildings or um, large trees. So that causes the wind speed to be slower near the surface. While in, in um, higher elevations, the wind speed is not slowed down because of that friction. So you can see in the cities on the left side of the figure four, um, the wind speed can slow down almost to zero. And on the right side in large um, open fields, the wind speed is closer to six meters per second. But of course that ranges with weather um, and area. Overall, this all just goes to show that elevated houses need to be um, looked at. And that's the purpose of my research is to see if there is an aerodynamic difference that needs to be studied more. So we use two models. Um, one of them was a slab on grade structure, which just means the foundation touches the, the earth. And one of them was an elevated house model elevated at seven feet. Our model was a one to five scale, which means that seven feet translated to around 16.8 inches. Um, both houses were elevated, well, the, both houses had a height of 8.3 feet or approximately 20 inches. And they were one story rectangular houses because in the Florida Panhandle region, that's the most common type of house. Each of the surfaces was outfitted with 180 total pressure taps. This is just a map of the pressure taps. They're concentrated around regions like the edges of the house or around stilted areas. So I want you to take a quick look at this diagram because my results later are gonna look very similar to this. So the north and the south are up and down. West is on the left, east is on the right. The roof is in the middle. And then if there's a floor for the elevated house, it's gonna be in the bottom right. So you'll see this in a little bit. So before testing, the wind speed was determined using COBRA probes um, at the mean roof height. The mean roof height is just the middle of the top and bottom of the roof. So this height, um, the speed was determined to be around 40% of the maximum fan capacity, which was approximately 50 miles per hour, but that ranged for both houses because the mean roof height was different for both of them. We chose to test the um, house at three different angles, 0, 45, and 90. Um, we didn't need to test more angles because of the symmetry of the model. Um, and we decided to test at 512 hertz, which is a which means that every second 512 data points were collected. So overall, uh, the tests were run for 60 seconds. So we had around 11,000 data points for each angle. Here's the wall wind facility in case you're unfamiliar with it. So in the top left, um, these are the back of the fans. So wind goes into them and then it comes out on the top right in the flow management box. The little yellow triangles, those are floor roughness elements. So when the wind goes over them, it recreates the atmospheric boundary layer. Um, that way it's a real test. Um, that circle on the floor, that's the turntable. So that's where we place our models on. And then this bottom diagram is just an overall diagram of the facility. So you can see where the fans are. You can see where the flow management box is and where the test structure is on the turntable. This is just an overview of our test arrangement, just in case you didn't quite get it before. Um, so you can see the elevated house model. The south wall uh, is at zero degrees currently. So that's when the wind is just hitting the south wall. The rotation direction was um, clockwise. So we turned it 45 degrees clockwise and then 90 degrees clockwise. So that instead of hitting the south wall, it'd be hitting the east wall. All of these distances are approximate. Um, one thing you need to know is the pressure coefficient, which is just how we translate pressure tap readings into readings that we can actually look at. A pressure tap, in case I didn't mention it earlier, is just a small pinpoint of an area that measures the wind speed, um, and not the wind speed, the wind pressure. So this just translates that pressure reading into something we can actually look at on a graph. So the change in P is just the pressure measured at the pressure tap. Rho is the density of air, which is approximately 1.204 kilogram per meter cubed, and V is the speed at the mean roof height, which is different for each model. So for the results, each angle was um, analyzed for the mean and minimum CP values. The reason we analyzed for the mean CP values is it gives an overall pressure distribution. And the reason we analyzed for the minimum CP values is it shows us where the suction occurred on the house. Um, the suction is important because that's where wall cladding failure occurs, where 
siding or shingles will just fly off the house. Another thing you know is separation and reattachment. This is when wind hits a structure, it separates from the structure and then it reattaches due to the suction. So in the first diagram on the left, you can see that on a rectangular um, figure, the wind hits the front of it, it separates on each side. The, su the um, arrows represent suction. The suction kind of sucks the wind back down to the house and then it hits the house again. Um, and there's also a wake at the back. On the right figure, it's a little more complex, um, but we're mainly just gonna be looking at the roof here. Um, so when the structure's turned to 90 degrees and the, it's hitting the roof, um, it hits the first corner of the roof um, right here. It kind of bounces off and it hits a later point at the roof and then it bounces off again. And those blue regions represent suction. So now here's my results, but I know it can be a lot to look at like this. So we're gonna look at one diagram and then we're gonna go back to the others. So this is the one diagram um, here. This is a, a zero degree elevated house. So in the south wall, we have um, positive pressure. You can tell it's positive because it's red. Every other color represents negative pressure. So here we have a positive pressure because um, that's, that's where the wind is hitting. On the west and east walls, we have negative pressure because that's where the wind is just flowing by the house. On the floor and the roof, they look almost identical and that's just because of separation and the attachment. So the yellow is where the, um, it, there's a lot of suction pressure because it's separating and then it's reattaching at the back where it's orange, there's a, there's a less of a negative pressure. So now we can go back and look at all four of them together. So the first column is non-elevated structures. The second column is elevated. The first row is at zero degrees and the second row is at 90 degrees. So if we just look at the zero degrees, the first row, um, the positive pressures are greater on the south wall for the elevated structure. Um, that's just because it's elevated higher. Um, we, if we also look at the floor and the roof, um, so the roof has less suction pressure on the elevated than on the non-elevated structure, um, but the east and west wall have higher suction pressures. Um, the floor also has a solid suction pressure as well. If we instead look at the 90 degrees, which is pretty much the same as the zero degrees, it's just turned. You can see that it looks almost identical. So the east wall has the highest um, positive pressure on the elevated structure. Um, the roof, you can see the separation and reattachment occurring, and the floor also has, looks like almost identical to the zero degree floor, except that it's just turned 90 degrees. Here are the minimum CP values. Those were the mean before. It's a lot easier to see where the suction is occurring because it's more of a blue or green color instead of just all being like red or orange. So you can see on the east and west wall, the elevated zero degree structure, that there's a, a larger blue area, and it's also a darker blue. And you can also see on the 90 degree structure on the north and south walls that there's um, negative pressures occurring. And on the east wall, there's like a positive pressure occurring. And separation and reattachment is occurring on both roofs at the zero degrees um, and the 90 degrees, as well as the floors of the elevated structures. This is the 45 degree structure, which is a bit different than the zero and 90 degree structures. So instead of hitting at a flat wall, it's actually hitting at a corner. Um, in between the south wall and the east wall. So that's where the highest positive pressure is occurring. Um, the elevated structure has a higher positive pressure than the non-elevated structure. Um, the roof has a little vortice ap appearing. Um, the elevated structure actually has higher suction than the non-elevated structure, which we'll kind of discuss later, but it is odd. Um, and the floor also has vortices occurring on, on it. So here's the minimum CP values instead of the mean CP values. And you can just see how much suction is occurring on the elevated house compared to the non-elevated. Um, it looks almost completely different. Um, but yeah, you can see the on the floors, which are actually here, um, that on the 45 degree, you can see that there's two blue regions um, here and here where vortices are occurring that aren't really occurring on the other floors. So you can also see separation and reattachment here. I just want you to see a close up of all the floors just in case you weren't able to see it earlier because they were pretty small. So, okay, what's happening? Elevation increases the maximum positive and negative pressure seen on elevated structures. So by elevating a house, you're exposing it to higher um, wind pressures. Um, there is separation and reattachment on the floor, which is a problem because it when um, 
when wind pressure is on the roof, creates suction, it can um, pull the roof off the house. And now the same thing can happen with the floor. So pretty much the house wants to completely combust. Um, the trend for suction on the roof decreases with an increase in stilt height, um, seen in the zero and 90 degree cases. So as you increase elevation, the suction decreases. But for the 45 degree case, it's actually opposite. As you increase the stilt height, the suction actually increases. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the reason for this is. It could just be um, separation reattachment isn't quite occurring here because of the angle. It could be something else entirely. Not quite sure, but definitely more testing needs to be done, and especially at different angles as well, um, to understand what's happening. So in conclusion, um, this was just a first attempt at creating CP values. That way engineers could use them when building these houses. Um, but really more research needs to be done to understand fully the aerodynamic differences, because clearly there are many. Um, and they need to be done at more angles in between zero and 90 degrees, because the 45 degree case was so different from the zero and 90 that it's um, presumed that more angles um, would also be different. I would like to thank my mentors, Haitham Muhammad, Kahim el Dr. Amal el Dr. Robin Nelson, Tyler McCormick, Dr. Julia Hopkins, and Jose Martinez for helping me throughout the entirety of this project. I wanna thank my friends and family for also helping me throughout the summer. Um, I wanna thank Northeastern for finding me this opportunity and FIU for accepting me into this opportunity and NSF for funding me. morning, everyone. Um, thank you for all attending via Zoom. My name is Alexis Slipovich. I am a fourth year civil engineering student from the University of Florida. My project today is going to be talking about large scale laboratory observations of transient wave dissipation from idealized mangrove forests. I will explain what that means. Um, starting in June of this year, I was able and had the opportunity to work at the OH Hinsdale Wave Research Lab at Oregon State University. The lab consists of two major facilities, a large wave flume and the um, directional wave basin. The presentation today will be talking about the large wave flume, which has the ability to create tra um, transient waves. I'm not gonna to go too much into detail about this. We've been hearing about it for the last two days. Um, hurricanes are getting stronger. Our population is moving closer to the shoreline. Um, and this is creating a variety of problems. And that is why it is so important more than ever to protect the built environment on our shorelines. So my experimental question, are mangrove trees an effective solution to help dissipate ocean wave height during extreme weather? Here's a graphic of what we're trying to show. So why are we looking at nature-based solutions? Well, green infrastructure is an interconnected network of green space that conserves natural ecosystem values and functions and provides associated benefits to human populations. Green infrastructure has the ability to help control flooding, stormwater management, and pollution filtration. It also improves community livability enriches our habitat and biodiversity, produces naturally cleaner air and water, and also has economical benefits. Uh, a case in New York City in the 1990s, they saved estimated $3.5 billion by investing into their green infrastructure surrounding the Catskills, as opposed to reestablishing and re-strengthening their water supply filtration system. So my experimental setup. Researchers from Oregon State University traveled to Florida in March of 2020 to survey mangroves for physical experimental design. The team used LIDAR and hand measurements to determine physical model dimensions. LIDAR was something that Kyle had spoken about yesterday as well. Um, the mangrove physical models were made from PVC and PEX pipe materials. Tree consisted of a singular breast with 14 roots. The breast height diameter was about 10, cent ooh, 10 centimeters and the root diameter was about three. That, those last images didn't really convey how large these structures were because we were able to test in the large wave flume, we were able to make these trees to scale of those of actual mangroves. Physical testing. This is the large wave flume. Um, it is approximately 340 feet long and 15 feet deep. 
This photo on the right shows you the wave machine. It pushes nearly 250,000 gallons of water to create transient waves. I have some videos to show you. So the transient wave is a singular long wave, and that's what we are seeing here on this left side. I want you to hear the sound. I don't know if you can. Um, so this, exp this, this um, demonstration on the right is actually not a transient wave. With a transient wave, we are to see a singular large wave. Any waves after that is the due to reflection, which Chelsea talked about extensively yesterday. Um, and this wave to the right, I wanted to show you for the fact that something interesting is happening. Before the wave has even interacted with the mangroves or the model mangrove forest, we are seeing that the wave is breaking before it interacts. There's a couple cases where we saw this in the transient wave demonstrations. And we had to actually disregard those, that data because it did not show a clear distinction between if the mangroves from before interacted with the forest until after, if that was purely the mangroves dissipating that wave height. So here are the three densities that we tested. Of course, no, no mangroves is the baseline data. And then we did high density, which was 25 mangrove trees. And then the, or I'm sorry, low density, which was 25 and the high density that was 50. This is the wave scale. This refers to the size of the waves that interacted with our mangrove forest. Um, the scale refers to the speed in which the wave moves, or I'm sorry, which the wave uh, maker moves. And so the slower the wave maker moves, the longer the wave period will be demonstrated by this scale 600 in the blue, but the wave will be shorter. Um, on the opposite end, we see our scale 200 with a much higher wave height and a much shorter time period. And that's why it's not surprising that this scale 200 is those cases that broke before they interacted with the mangroves. This is a profile view of our, our layout. You can see our mangrove forest right here. Um, this is a layout of our instrumentation. Really the most important point to note out is that we have our array one, which is our left side, which is the side that um, refers to the area before the wave has interacted with the mangroves, and then our array two over here, which is after it's interacted. And you'll hear me refer to array one and array two in a minute. Data analysis. So the primary tool I used in this experiment or this data analysis was MATLAB. Um, wave gauges had the capability to, excuse me, um, collect a data point every 100th of a second. So this graph you're looking at right now is about 20,000 data points. Um, we can see this transient wave as the peak of this one right here. And then the rest following after is any collection of um, reflection. But really this, this, this peak is what we've been looking at. Um, by using MATLAB, we were able to track this maximum wave height, which we use to determine how much the, dent, or the wave height was dampened. So this is our primary results model. Um, as you can see, our x-axis is displayed as the um, x distance from the wave maker. Um, and then our, our y-axis is our water or our wave height. Um, from wave gauge one to array one, we really wouldn't see any change. We haven't interacted with any mangroves. Nothing should really be happening here. And then from array one to array two, we see our mangrove forest here represented by these green lines. We do see some things happening. Our baseline is this light blue, low density medium, and then the dark blue is a high density. We really wouldn't expect our baseline to change at all through here. And that's why you see it at relatively the same point. There's no interactions happening. It's purely the baseline. The most exciting thing about this graph is our high density cases showing the biggest decrease in wave height here at, on the side of the, the graphic. Something interesting we do notice is at wave gauge 13 is this jump. Um, this is due to the fact the at the end of um, the flume, after it's passed through the mangroves, there is a bathymetry um, beach displayed at the bottom, which 
essentially stops the wave and with with the least amount of reflection as possible. But because there is still going to be reflection, this part right here um, was suspected to be the cause of reflection and those two waves superimposing. So, so that this is typical. This this first image is typical of what we expect or saw in our data, um, where we're seeing the high density showing the greatest decrease in wave height, um, and relatively this gradient of the low density in between. Interestingly enough, um, we're going to look at those scale two hundred cases where there was breaking beforehand. Um, and this is again proven by what we're seeing from wave gauge one to array one. Again, we really wouldn't be expecting anything to be happening here, but with those waves breaking most likely in this area, we see the jump. The other interesting thing is that because this jump and the breaking of that wave dissipates the most energy, we also see that regardless of density, the wave is still decreased the same amount. And then our final case here, which is even showing some weirder things as well. Um, there's a, this is a combination of all the instances that we were talking about before. So we do see a slight jump, again, most likely due to the breaking before interacting with the mangroves. But we also see this second jump, which is again, a combination of that reflection off of the beach, and then also the possibility of breaking happening later into in, in, into the forest. Um, the biggest thing to take from this graphic is that whatever reaction is causing that the high density and the, or I'm sorry, the low density and the baseline to jump is mitigated by the high density mangroves. This is essentially a combination of all the graphics we've just seen where we are determining in percentages how much our wave has dissipated after interacting with the mangroves. Um, we would really expect our baseline case, this light blue here, to be at 1.0 uh, due to the effects I've been talking about. Um, that's partially why this value could be a little bit higher. Um, unfortunately, the number of data points we collected wasn't as many as we would like to do in the future. And I'll talk about that more in future work. But um, with the more data points, we would most likely see this closer to 1.0. The most exciting thing to see about this, and this is kind of moving on to my conclusions, um, the experiment was overall successful in showing that the addition of mangrove forests allowed for the attenuation of wave height to transmit for transient waves. The transmission coefficient for an 18 meter cross shore mangrove patch with low density was 90.7% with a 9.29 attenuation, so almost a 10% decrease in wave height. And then the transmission coefficient for high density was 74.10%, which is almost, or which is 25.9% attenuation, which is relatively impressive. Um, going back to what we were talking about with the density earlier, uh, the density had increased by two, a factor of two. And so we were hoping to see, or curious to see if we would see the attenuation also increased by a factor of two. Um, we actually see a better result than that. Um, and this again, will go into the future work, um, pro doing a different, let me reverse. So um, I point out here, this 18 meter cross shore, because the results that we found here are very specific to the fact that the mangrove patch itself, I'll show you right here was 18 meters long. Um, it is also, this, this data is also specific to the density of the patch as well. So there's not much more that we can say in terms of this percentage regarding general mangroves. Um, we do see obviously a positive in the decrease of wave height, but in terms of future work, we would love to test longer lengths. We'd love to test different densities to see how that changes the results. And then also with all those um, jumping in, in our data that we saw, um, it would probably be best firsthand to test uh, the same data, this, this is a very similar data with a longer break between from when the mangroves end and where the beach begins 
this would prevent and hopefully prevent a lot more reflection from showing up in those earlier gauges versus wave gauge 13, which was on the further end, um, which we would still see reflection later from. Um, these are my references. Uh, thank you to NSF for sponsoring this. And then I want to definitely th say the special thank you to Dr. Pedro Lamonico and my graduate mentor, Karen Kelty, for all their help. Dr. Daniel Cox, Tori, Dr. Robin Nelson, Chelsea, and Carter for all of their help as well. Questions? Yes. Absolutely. So the question was, um, what was, or did we look at anything to do with force or an acceleration in terms of the mangroves? And I'm going to take you back to our layout over here. Um, the work that I was focused on was strictly transient waves. Um, regular waves were tested, and which is a series of the same wave over and over. And also there was a whole set of waves that were tested where a seawall was placed at the end, um, which purely tracked the force. Um, and that, that was the main goal with that, those experiments. There were different force gauges on this wall and comparing the density versions. So like low, no density to those of like high density, comparing those forces were done. Um, there's a whole team of like researchers doing different aspects of this. So the, that was actually investigated, but that those findings haven't been fi finished yet or any other questions? Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Carter Howe, and this summer I worked at Oregon State University's OHN Scale Wave Research Laboratory on the NSF funded MRO22 project. I'm excited to share my research, which is the wave energy dissipation and transmission across the Emerald 22 mats. So every year, East Coast communities are threatened by the potentially devastating effects of hurricane season. Uh, between 1980 and 2020, hurricanes have caused nearly two billion or two trillion dollars in damages. Um, additionally, current socioeconomic and climate trends. Um, have indicated that yearly hurricane impact as well as cost may increase by at least fourfold. Um, to combat hurricanes as well as other coastal hazards, communities are constantly looking for resilient infrastructure to protect their shorelines. Typically, this will come in the form of more classical, hard engineered infrastructure, such as seawalls or breakwaters. However, dynamic nearshore conditions due to climate change, so for instance, sea level rise have caused more natural adaptive solutions to be worth investigating. So a little bit of background knowledge. There's a lot of uh, literature on how natural elements such as vegetation can serve in um, coastal resilient solutions, as opposed to hard infrastructure, um, which removes fisheries, habitats, as well as biodiversity. Uh, natural solutions have the potential to maintain or even improve these ecosystems by acting as carbon sinks and increasing water quality, um, while also being just as um, effective in attenuating incoming wave energy, or in some cases even more effective. Um, like I said, um, there's a lot of literature in how um, vegetation can serve to dissipate incoming wave energy. However, most of the time, this is in the form of submerged vegetation. There's not a lot of information or good experimentation on um, floating vegetation. So this is sort of where the Emerald 2.2 project comes in. The Emerald 22 project is a network of floating interconnected mats that serve to dissipate incoming wave energy. At the scale of a single mat, um, it is a mesh recycled plastic top that's been fused to a hard recycled porous plastic bottom. Um, and these mats actually promote the growth of organic life both above and below the water level. So above, as you can kind of see in this rendering, you would have the local marsh grass. And then below you would have the accumulation of stuff like seaweed or kelp or barnacles. Um, and so these mats are cheap, they're quickly deployable, and then they're also adaptive to nearshore conditions like I was talking about earlier. Um, and these mats are also pre-engineered. 
Uh, so they're individual mats. So if one were to fail or if the system would need more reinforcing, these mats could easily be brought in and placed. So the Emerald Tutu team in collaboration with the OHNsdale Wave Research Laboratory uh, primarily aimed to observe the parameter-based reaction of the ML22 mat network. And by parameters, I mean um, wave height, wave angle, wave period, uh, irregular versus regular waves, and then also the configuration that they're in. I specifically looked at the wave height reduction caused by the mat network. And I did this by looking at a series of 20 wave gauges, 10 before the mat system, and then 10 also after. Ultimately, all of this data will be used to validate a numerical model. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. So the experiments were performed in the directional wave basin of the OH Hinsdale Wave Research Laboratory. And the instruments that we used were wave gauges, uh, 3D velocimeters, pressure gauges, load cells, and then also a infrared motion capture system. And on the right, you can see uh, one of the configurations that we use uh, in the partially filled basin. So in order to capture the real world wave effects on the ML22 mat network, we needed to find materials that were representative of the actual design. And this was actually done before I arrived at the laboratory. The team found materials that they deemed acceptable. And so we ended up making 44 mats um, by creating a canvas shell that was sewn together with a two inch thick insulation board. Um, as well as wood discards provided by the city of Corvallis. And so the wood discards and insulation boards provided um, both buoyancy and then also mass. And so on top and bottom to simulate the effects of vegetation, we added a spiral rain screen that's actually used for house siding um, to kind of simulate the effects of the local marsh grass. And then on the bottom, we used a very fine netting that was weaved in and out of the bottom. And that represented um, kelper seagrass. And on the right, you can see pretty much every component of the mats except for the insulation board. Um, that's kind of one of them opened up. On the left, we have a picture of what I would call the Emerald Tutu assembly line. You can see the um, on the right side of the image, the stacked uh, insulation board as well as the stacked canvas. And at that station, the insulation board was sewn in between the canvas and a small about two foot opening was left open so that the mats could then be taken to the left side of that image where it was then filled with um, wood chips. And so from there, we tried to machine sew it shut, but we actually found that that wasn't possible just due to how heavy and hard to maneuver it was. So we actually ended up having to hand sew it. And that was really tedious because um, not all of us were super skilled at hand sewing, but we also had to make sure that it was able to um, take the forces uh, that were applied by some of the higher wave heights that they experienced. Uh, and then on the right, you can see the individual mats being craned in. Uh, you can also see that the water level is about knee deep. This is just because the mats were about 130 pounds once they were completed. And it was a very awkward weight to move over around. So by filling it to about knee deep, we could just float the mats to where they needed to be and then um, splice them into the network as needed. So two mat configurations were designed. There was one sparse and one dense, and you can see both of those at the bottom. Um, there is the sparse on the left side and then the dense on the right. Each blue circle represents a mat, and six of them are put into hexagonal nodes. And then groups of two mats are tied to the center in sort of a rope tree. These nodes are then connected to each other, which are then connected to the side of the basin and also the shore and then uh, the back. And so once we tested both the sparse and the dense, we actually strengthened the top of the dense network and then flipped it over just because we thought that the top material would be more effective in dissipating wave energy. And we just kind of wanted to exaggerate the effects and see what kind of results that would produce. So the wave conditions that we ran, we ran both regular and irregular waves with heights ranging from 10 to 55 centimeters, periods of one to six seconds, and then angles of zero and 30 degrees. We found eventually that wave height had little impact on the overall dissipative trend of the mats. And so I'll only be analyzing just 10 to 20 centimeter wave heights. But I have a video here of actually one of the tests. And if you look really closely, you can see kind of dark spots in the water. And this is actually where um, some of the mats ripped and started just spewing out wood chips. So uh, I'll talk about that a little bit later. 
So some of the challenges that we encountered, there was certainly a time constraint in the mat construction. Um, the more time it took to make these mats, the less time we had to do testing. Um, but at the same time, we had to make sure that these mats were able to withstand the forces of the waves, and we needed to make sure everything was right to get accurate results. Um, and then also, like I said, the mats experienced ripping when they were subjected to higher wave heights. So on the right, you can see me actually in the water, hand sewing one of these mats back together in between tests. And this was really difficult just because of how like, much intention they were. Um, so we really had to wait until the basin was going to find a more long-term solution. Um, and then also scheduling test case or test cases and then the drain fill times. There was a lot of uh, just timing requirements and draining took a whole day to do. Um, filling took about two days to do. So we had to kind of work around that with our test cases. So these are the results for the 10 centimeter wave heights. Uh, the orange line is the dense configuration, the gray is the dense flipped, and then the blue is the sparse. On the x-axis, we have wave period in seconds, and then on the y-axis, we have the transmission coefficient. And the transmission coefficient is the significant wave height after the mat network, divided by the wave height before the mat network. So a transmission coefficient of 0.2, for instance, would mean that there's an 80% reduction in wave height. Uh, so as you can see, the dense network was more effective in dissipating wave energy. Um, and you can also see that the relationship is very period dependent. Um, as the period increases, the dissipative effects kind of reduce. Um, and you can also notice that around two seconds for the 10 centimeter wave height and then 2.5 seconds for the dense, or sorry, for the dense configuration, um, the transmission coefficient reaches one, which means that there's zero rate wave reduction. This isn't indicative of the mats failing at that point. It's more so at that configuration, they can no longer really dissipate higher wave periods. So for instance, if maybe they were organized in a different manner, they would be more effective with these higher wave periods. So these are the results for the 20 centimeter waves. Uh, like I said, there wasn't a huge difference in wave height and the overall trend. You can see it's more or less the same. There is a data missing for the one second period for both dense configurations. Um, you also notice there's kind of a weird relationship with the dense flip. This is because we pretty quickly realized that this mat network was uh, losing efficiency uh, pretty quickly. So we wanted to gain more insight into how it behaves just before the network fails. So we ran interperiod tests at um, two to three seconds at 0.2 second increments. So that's why it's uh, a little bit less linear than the others. So overall, we found that mat behavior was uh, primarily period dependent. There was little influence even doubling the height from 10 to 20 centimeters. Um, like I said, we the transmission coefficient quickly reached one, but it's not indicative of mat effectiveness. Again, the configuration can be changed and we did experience more effective results at higher wave periods. So moving forward, we now have a set of test cases to serve as the basis for a numerical model, like I was talking about a little bit earlier. And this numerical model could eventually be used to simulate the effects of real world and mat deployment in actual locations. So on the right, we have a rendering of the Emerald Tutu mat network in the Boston Harbor. Um, alongside this, we could also um, change different parameters as far as um, how the mats are configured, the mat sizes, um, and a lot of different things like that. And so eventually this could be used to design and test um, actual field experiments to be done. So lastly, I would just wanna thank the uh, NSF for funding my research. Um, I'd like to thank the Emerald 2.2 team, uh, Dr. Gabriel Silla, Julia Hopkins, as well as the rest of them. Um, they definitely helped with my research and this is their project as well. Um, I'd like to thank my faculty mentor, Dr. Pedro Monaco, my neighbor mentor, Dr. Robin Nelson, as well as my RU colleagues, Chelsea Willey and Alexis Lekovich. Uh, these are my references. Uh, thank you so much for listening to my presentation. If you all have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah. This one. Mm -hmm. So if you can see these red dots, um, these are the wave gauge locations. So there's 10 before and 10 after, and we just took an average of all of them. Mm -hmm. um, I personally do not um, 
they actually won a competition for this project, which is how they received this funding. Um, they have a prototype actually in the Boston Harbor. I'm not sure if it's still floating, I'd have to ask about that, but um, I know over the course of our research, they were showing us pictures of just how it was gaining more and more biomass uh, while it floated. So that's really cool because as it gains more organic life, it's dissipative effects increase as well. Oh, I'm sorry. He asked if there were, what was it, if there were any companies that were offering this technology, um, to which I answered, I'm not sure, um, as far as I know. Uh, I mentioned that the rest were tied to the wall. How do you know how the mats contributed to it? Um, as far as Chelsea's question, she asked that the ropes were tied to the wall, and if we knew if the dissipation was purely from the mats or if the wall contributed to it. Um, our thinking was that the wall did not contribute to it. Uh, the rope was um, not extremely taut, so it didn't um, distribute that load into the wall. Um, I know wind was not a measured variable, but it's under category three wind conditions. Um, I'm not sure what the wind conditions would be. Um, to be honest, I'm sure it would have some effect on the vegetation above, but as far as how they float in the water, um, it, it wouldn't, I would not imagine it would have effect. Um, Beatrice asked, for the long period waves, you mentioned a different configuration may be more effective. You think the mat configuration needs to be larger to dissipate these waves? That's definitely something we we're thinking about. Uh, we are also configured. We are also thinking about maybe with this hexagonal configuration, maybe putting a mat in the center of that to pick up some of the waves. Um, we did notice that for the larger period waves, they almost just like completely moved under the system. There was like barely any effect. Um, so making it larger might be something worth looking into. Also the size of the mats, maybe even having different size mats in the same network. Um, those are all things that would be worth exploring in the numerical model. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello everyone, my name is Miguel Payan and I'm a rising senior from the University of Oklahoma studying architectural engineering. And that's passing when I got to do research at the University of Florida's Powell Family Structures and Materials Laboratory on East Campus. Here's a brief table of contents that outlines this presentation, um, but we could go, go ahead and get right started. But um, as you all know, natural hazards really damage the world in a very variety of different ways, and wind specifically is no different. Um, here are a couple of pictures of damaging effects on wind um, located in some Florida, Florida areas. Um, but the thing is that, that, that simulating these uh, natural phenomena that take place around the world is the key to mitigating their effects on the Gulf's environment. So there's a growing need to monitor these effects and do what we can to go against um, these natural phenomena. Um, and simulating these is going to allow scientists and engineers to make more practical recommendations to certain municipalities um, so they could enforce stricter building codes or just um, do things better for the built environment and for the safety of the community. Uh, which takes us to the main basis of my project here at the University of Florida with their boundary Larry wind tunnel, UFBLWT. The UFBLWT is composed of a bit over 1,100 roughness elements, which is known as, which is known as the terraformers for the boundary layer in the center. Um, as you can see in the schematic, there's a fan bank on the left side, and this fan bank is composed of eight large fans that are able to produce um, wind speeds of eight meters per second, which is roughly a bit under 18 miles per hour. Um, in addition to this, there's uh, urban spires that allow for an atmospheric boundary layer, um, along with something called FFM, which I'll explain more later. But the boundary layer wind tunnel is very practical and helpful for simulating these natural phenomena that take place around the world. 
um, and really help out with meteorological and wind engineering applications, such as like the dispersion of pollution of pollutants and environmental science concepts, um, structural loads on the built environment and wind energy, um, assessing wind energy resources such as wind turbines. Um, however, the boundary layer wind tunnel at the University of Florida solely itself falls short in displaying these instances of transient wind which is also known as non-stationary wind behavior. However, this contraption is seen here as FFM, which stands for the flow field modulator, is composed of over 300 smaller fans that has the capacity to accelerate and decelerate quickly enough to exhibit these um, instances of non-transient wind behavior. The eight large fans at the fan bank don't have a, a quick enough acceleration with the rotations per minute, to create these instances of transient wind behavior. So here's a closer look at the flow flow modulator, which is, in, which is in essence a way to control the flow, but it's composed of 319 smaller fans in a very hexagonal cell format, and they can reach a max velocity of 23 meters per second. So the basis of my project is how well can the FFM replicate the instances of non-stationary non transient wind behavior within the wind tunnel? Now, as you can see here, this is a, a picture of the flow field modulator um, composed of all these like individual fans. So um, whenever the flow field modulator is in, is in action, because um, it slides out from the boundary layer wind tunnel, so you could like operate it without it, but it works in conjunction with the boundary layer wind tunnel. So both of the fan systems are working um, whenever you're using the flow field modulator. Um, and just some background to explain stationary and what non-stationary um, data is within time series. Um, but as to broadly speak, stationary is the opposite of non-stationary. So I'll just explain what stationary is. But the variances within this data are very limited. And for the most part, it's very consistent and continuous. You could, uh, you could forecast and predict uh, future um, instances where stationary data is um, just operating in these very uh, in various examples such as like a treadmill pace or radio signals um, and on the contrary non-stationary data within time series is very just unpredictable and the variance has changes over time whether it be a linear progression a difference in time intervals or just the different parameters that make up these uh, signals such as frequency and amplitude and some examples of this non-stationary data that you can see around the world include walking at random paces, um, also like drifting when you walk, um, temperature distributions such as like heat transfer, and of course the stock market, that's really unpredictable. Um, in terms of testing the efficacy of the FFM, these are the main things used um, to, for this project. As you see here, the flow field modulator, um, the roughness elements that I explained earlier, and here's a small video that kind of explains how they work, but they essentially change in height um, due to some pre-configured um, element size. And it takes around 120 seconds for all 1100 uh, terraformers to like change to the specific height. You can see COPA probes, these COPA probes will be um, recording the mean speeds over a span of 30 seconds at different heights. And these are the top three components are things that deal with the boundary layer wind tunnel along with the FFM. So they're actual physical pieces. When it comes to the other pieces that we'll be using to assess the efficacy of the flow field modulator, uh, we'll be using benchmark data that has already been collected. As you can see in this picture, um, there's, a program in, in Florida called the Florida Coastal Monitoring Program. And these, uh, this program basically goes around during tropical storms or high speed winds um, to track the, track the speeds of this wind. And then that data is collected for laboratory usage. And then all the data within this project is analyzed using MATLAB. So, the methodology concerning this uh, project is first, we need to figure out which analysis techniques we are using to best determine um, when this non-stationary transient wind behavior is occurring. 
And there's like very, there's stationary analysis techniques, but due to the nature of non-stationary and the sporadic nature of it, um, those stationary techniques won't really be effective when analyzing non-stationary data. So once we identify these uh, analysis techniques, we're going to create synthetic data that we have more control over um, and change some parameters so that we could just get a feel of how these stationary and non-stationary analysis techniques could um, give us some preliminary results when it comes to this um, these analysis techniques. Moving forward, um, based on that synthetic data that we created, we'll be applying those same techniques onto onto this uh, onto like the synthetic data that we created to see like which analysis techniques are more superior in some cases, such as changing the amplitude, changing the frequency, and lastly, based on those results, we'll be assessing the efficacy using uh, the benchmark data that we've been that I've mentioned earlier and comparing it to see if the FFM is able to replicate those results. So first things first, these are the identified techniques that we ended up deciding to go with. All of these are compatible with MATLAB under their digital signals and filtering transformation toolkit. Um, but the first one, the short time Fourier transform, the other two are continuous wave transform and the empirical mode decomposition. So now that we've got the first step done, Moving on to the sec second step, which is creating the synthetic data. So we ended up creating four different cases and the parameters that we ended up choosing to like change are amplitude and frequencies when it comes to these signals. So the first case, both of them are constant. The second case, um, we have a changing amplitude, the switch uh, constant frequency. The third case is a constant amplitude, but a changing frequency. And the fourth case is both th that they're both changing. So once we went ahead and created our synthetic data using a series of like cosine waves, we went ahead and tested uh, the analysis techniques onto the synthetic data. And here are the results from um, um, the, te the testing of those techniques. As you could see case one, um, this is like the most basic signal that we created with our synthetic data. Um, in this first figure, right, in the first graph in the first figure, in figure three, uh, you can see just like a blob of um, blue, but just, um, it's a very zoomed out cosine signal. Um, so if we were to zoom in, you could actually see the, the constant amplitude and frequency all throughout, but since we're zoomed out, it looks like that. And in case two, we have an increasing amplitude and a constant frequency. So it starts off like at zero um, amplitude and it raises progressively throughout time. And then all three um, analysis techniques were applied to these signals. And we also decided to compare them to the power spectrum of these signals. So as you can see here at the bottom of these uh, figures, we see a figure called spectrum. And this lets us know what's the operating frequency that these signals were kind of based upon. So it kind of tells us like at which uh, frequency specifically um, that signal is operating, which is 1.5 which is like a parameter we were able to decide on our own selves when, when it came to the synthetic data. And then you could see how short time Fourier transform, continuous wavelet transform and empirical mode decomposition ultimately an analyze these uh, synthetic data. Um, when it comes to the constant frequencies, it's not that like apparent, um, like the results, these analysis techniques um, kind of don't really see the constant any big differences when you have a constant frequency, but whenever you have a changing frequency in the next two cases, you'll be able to see like a more, um, more interesting looking uh, analysis techniques, which I'll take you over here. So case three and case four both have different um, sampling or changing frequencies. Um, as you can see here in the power spectrum, we start off with um, the first 250 seconds, we first start off with a sampling frequency of one hertz. Then the next 250 seconds, we use a sampling frequency of two hertz. Then the next 200, 250 um, seconds, we use a, neck, a three hertz. And then we continue that until four hertz, until we get four hertz. And as you can see, the analysis techniques do kind of something weird um, as they switch frequencies, specifically the short time Fourier transform. 
Um, and within this, whenever you change frequencies, you see some noise areas, those vertical columns that kind of um, just create more noise within those graphs. And that's something we wanted to avoid. So right off the bat, we noticed that short time Fourier transform was gonna be the least um, preferred analysis technique. So then it came down to the continuous wavelet transform and empirical mode decomposition. And you could see that they're pretty similar. However, the continuous wavelet transform does have a larger tolerance of the power output. Um, so then the empirical mode decomposition showed the narrow, net more narrow um, tolerance when it came to energy output, which you could tell by like the, the color of the, the streak it is. Um, so these are our results from our um, synthetic data. Moving on, um, the discussion was that the empirical mode decomposition was the preferred um, analysis technique, just because due to the bare eye, we could like see at what point um, the operating frequency was, and it had the least amount of noise. As we saw the short time Fourier series, whenever it interacted with an increasing or just changing frequency, that kind of um, gave so much noise to the graphs that we kind of wanted to avoid from that. Um, at the end of the day, the continuous wavelength transform is an effective way too, but empirical mode decomposition just had smaller, um, param uh, smaller tolerances with the energy output. Um, however, um, due to like the scheduling of this project, we couldn't really go forward and use the analysis techniques to test benchmark data or test like the efficacy of the FFM to replicate these uh, instances of transient one behavior. So moving forward, uh, we want to continue like steps four to determine if the FFM is actually producing these cases of real transient one behavior. And as I mentioned before, the Florida Coastal Monitoring Program has collected lots of data that we could like look into and see and continue to test the efficacy of the FFM and see if it's able to replicate these results. Um, and by replicating these results, we could conduct more uh, transient wind behavior experiments within the boundary layer wind tunnel, which will allow us to like extrapolate more concrete um, philosophies behind um, this specific phenomenon found in nature. My acknowledgments, of course, I want to thank the NSF award with this experimental facility. I want to thank Dr. Gurley and Mario Hadatus, both from the University of Florida, Dr. Gurley, my faculty mentor, and Mario, my graduate mentor. I'd like to thank Dr. Robin, which is the NERI REU program director, Ms. Boyer and Mr. Nazareth, which are the SURF program directors at the University of Florida. I got to um, sit in very developmental workshops regarding academia and how to present. I'd like to give a really gracious shout out to Dr. Scott Harvey, who is uh, a professor at my home institution and took me in earlier this year during the spring semester. I'd also like to thank um, Sophia, the OU Bickner Scholars Program, and uh, Mi Gente Mi Amigos, which is Spanish for my people and my friends. So. Um, here are my references and time for any questions. So I got a question in my room that ask the, the specific shape of the hexagonal. And I got asked that question in my poster presentation yesterday and I didn't have an answer, but due to the modular design of hexagons, you could be as compact as possible. Um, so that's like the main philosophy why hexagons were used. Awesome, well, thank you very much. Hello, everybody. My name is Anya Matthews. I am a rising sophomore computer science major currently attending Howard University. This summer, I earned the opportunity to work with DesignSafe to use data structures to interpolate ground motion intensity at sites in the next generation of the faction database. Liquefaction is a phenomenon that occurs when water-saturated soils lose their ability to support the structures that bear weight upon them. 
caused by ground shaking, the effects of liquefaction are detrimental. Buildings and secure structures are prone to collapse, triggering the um, destruction of entire communities. This image right here is an occurrence of liquefaction at the Christchurch New Zealand event. This research will focus on the Christchurch New Zealand event um, as it is a series of earthquakes with multiple instances of liquefaction. Right. The NGL database or the Next Generation Liquefaction Database is a source for geotechnical engineers to access case history data relating to the effects of liquefaction. The main goal of the NGL database is to ensure that researchers have access, can access reliable data relating to liquefaction and ground failure. All right, um, this is a map of Christchurch, New Zealand taken directly from the database. This beach ball looking circle right here marks the fault segment and just the event. Um, these gray pins right here mark could be liquefaction sites. And if you zoom in a little bit, um, these green circles will also point to those gray pins as well. All right, although not pictured, there are recording stations throughout the area that researchers often base their site ground motion estimates on. Um, They'll use engineering judgment, which is kind of just saying, um, this is the recording station right here. This is the site right here. We're just gonna tweak that value a little bit. And that's gonna be our site um, ground motion evaluation for um, any model that they use. And um, that's not beneficial because the data will not be consistent throughout different models. Um, so that being said, the purpose of this research is to contribute to the NGL project by finding a way to statistically quantify um, ground shaking intensity at sites in the NGL database the liquefaction has been observed. All right, so the materials that we use um, throughout the entire project were Jupyter Notebooks with Python found on Design State. Um, MySQL is a relational database management system used to query information from the database again. Um, OpenQuake is a seismic hazard analysis tool that we use to make our estimations based on the observed values. All right, so the first step of our methods was to query data from the NGL database. Um, from this, we got all of the information from the event, site, recording station, fault segments, um, liquefaction observations, and um, liquefaction manifestation, which is the indication of liquefaction at the sites. We also got the recorded, inten recorded intensity measures at the stations. Um, this is the output of a successful MySQL query, gathering the site and station information. And I chose to display this table because this is what we will use for the next step of our methods. So here we have the station ID, which kind of just goes with each of the stations, the station name, the coordinates, the shear wave velocity at 30 feet, the peak ground acceleration, which would be our intensity measure of choice, and then the peak ground velocity. All right. Um, the next step is to use OpenQuid to compute station intensity measures. Um, so for a given um, site perimeter, for given parameters, um, which we'll see on the next slide, the median bore et al model will spit out um, a median and standard deviation. And it does this because um, all of the data from OpenQuick is kind of based on earthquake data from around the world. So once you put in those parameters, which we will see here, it will give you those values. So we define shear wave velocity, appended all of those station coordinates into um, this that we can use for the rest of the research. Um, Rupture surface, magnitude, which we got from the event table, fault surface, fault rupture, and general board distance. All right. Um, so from there, we will get the mean values and the standard deviation. And the way that we compute the median is to take the exponential of the mean. All right. So the next step is to compute the residual for the recording stations of the Christchurch event. This is done by dividing the model PGA values that we just got from OpenQuake and then dividing that by the station PGA values that we queried from the NGL database and taking the log of that entire value. And then we calculate the adjusted residual um, by, um, excuse me, by subtracting the mean of the residuals from each one of those residuals. And we do this to kind of just take out the chance of error, because again, the open code model is based on a collection of data for algorithms. All right, this is a very grand product of residuals, as well as a Gaussian curve or a normal curve. And then the purpose of this is kind of just to see how well it fits. Um, this is an appropriate for, for the model because we use it for um, Gaussian, Gaussian process um, reduction or geospatial creeping, um, which we kind of see here in this next slide. Right here plotted are all of the station coordinates. Um, it's kind of cool because you can see um, this imitates the shape of New Zealand. Um, this key to the side um, 
is kind of a key of all of the residuals where it's yellow right here, the residual value is higher and this deep blue color over here is where it's lower. The fact that um, not really many of the residuals or the plots are in these like extreme areas kind of shows us, okay, we did everything right. We can use this mesh to go to the next step, which is to um, use these site coordinates right here given to us by our graduate mentor to plot the, um, the site residuals. So this little clump right here is just because as you can see, they're all kind of like similar to each other, um, the coordinates. So we'll plot those and then get an array of residuals from interpolating that. And um, we will compute the end result by taking, um, excuse me, I missed a step. Um, so from after plotting these residuals, we're gonna run OpenQuick one more time with these given um, VS30 values. So we'll input that into OpenQuake and we'll get the um, sites median PGA values that we'll use to compute this end result. So we'll take the log of the model PGA that I just talked about and then the site residuals from that second creaking mesh and then take the exponential of that. Um, the final result will be um, these final PGA values. So right here are the site residuals as we can see are all, all kind of similar because again, they were in that same clump and they were close to all the same color. Um, the PGA estimates and then the final PGA and the reason why we um, take both of those is because we um, have the estimate and we take into account our observed data from the database. All right, in conclusion, we effectively methodized a way to statistically quantify peak ground acceleration at sites in the database. Um, the site residuals were slightly negative, meaning they were a tad bit lower than expected. Um, a good further step for this research would be to use even more parameters um, that we hadn't really talked about in the research, as well as not really um, like round those numbers as well. Um, this data can be used for more research efforts such as levy, levy modeling or any um, or at any earthquake research model. This was really just a tool to statistically quantify ground motion intensity, so um, there can be consistent data for researchers to use. All right, um, I would like to acknowledge the National Science Foundation for funding this project. My staff mentor, Dr. Scott Brandenburg from UCLA, my graduate student mentors, Kenneth Hudson and Tristan Buckrice, also from UCLA, Robin Nelson for guiding us throughout the entire New Year experience, um, my colleague, Daniel Taylor, Daniel Taylor, excuse me, for literally helping me whenever I needed it, um, and my friends and family for letting me talk about my research. These are my references. Um, does anybody have any questions? Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Eva Laurent, and today I'll be presenting on learning from Hurricane Harvey, analyzing contributions from the SN network. This was my project during the course of the summer during the Neri RU summer program. On a global scale, disasters are increasing in intensity and frequency. To meet this issue, the hazards and disaster field, also known as the H&D field, must include all perspectives. While people look at the hazards and disaster field and predominantly think of the natural sciences and engineering, it must also include the social sciences. However, the social sciences as a discipline happen to be particularly overlooked. And to encourage transdisciplinary research where all perspectives are included in disaster application and research, I'll be looking during my research project, I hope to answer what is the knowledge, skills, and training characteristics of ESSER members, which I will elaborate on. To provide further background, this summer I worked with the Social Science Extreme Events Research Network, commonly known as the ESSER Network, and this was formed at the University of Colorado Boulder to meet, it was meant to meet a gap in knowledge about the status and expertise of social scientists working in disaster studies. And the goal of the ESSER network was to amplify the contributions of social scientists while expanding the evidence base, the evidence base of so social science research. Regarding the ESSER network, I particularly looked at 1,230 members who happened to input their data willingly into the ESSER network. And I looked at specific researcher characteristics. This included aspects of researcher status, such as whether researchers delineate themselves as an academic researcher, whether they self-identified as a student researcher or government researcher, 
or whether they worked within the private sector or for nonprofits. In addition, I chose to focus on these four specific disaster disciplines, which include political science, public administration and emergency management, decision making and risk analysis, and disaster science. I specifically chose these four disciplines due to their presence in the real world application of emergency management and disaster policy. Aside from this, I decided to look at the certain variables, including such as whether a social scientist has ever studied a hurricane and whether an SCR member has ever studied Hurricane Harvey as a specific event. Aside from this, my final variable included whether the SCR members identified as a core researcher, whether, which means a researcher who happens to be to, on a regular basis participate within the hazards and disaster field and happens to regularly produce scholarship, an emerging researcher, which can be considered a student researcher or those new to the field, a periodic researcher, those who happen to study um, a disaster topic occasionally in regards to their scholarship, and situational researchers, um, those who happen to study a disaster topic in a one-off situation or, or occurrence. And during the course of my project, I used data in 17 to analyze the data that I, that I received. And I used Excel, Microsoft Excel, to, to visualize my data and to further examine it. Regarding the results that I was able to obtain, almost more than half of SCR members happen to identify as academic researchers. Following this, approximately 17% of SCR members happen to identify as a student researcher. Almost 9% of SCR members identified as a government researcher and an increase in, the, in order from increasing to decreasing happens in terms of their presence happens to be nonprofit researchers, independent researchers, and those who happen to not specifically identify with any of the labels that were in the ESSER survey. The smallest demographic happens to be private sector researchers. Regarding the selected disciplines of study for that I was able to analyze, approximately 396% I mean, approximately 396 um, ESSER members, they were they identified as a disaster scientist. Following this, um, um, in, similar, in a similar proportion, um, decision making and risk analysis and public administration and emergency management, um, they shared about the same number um, of a presence in terms of discipline selection and Regarding my selected discipline, um, political science was the least selected among SCR members, which I discovered in my project. Focusing on my emphasis regarding hurricanes, um, approximately 45% of SCR members have studied in hurricanes. Meanwhile, approximately 54% of SCR members have never studied hurricanes. Um, despite this, um, one in 12 approximately one in 12 um, of SCR members, they have studied Hurricane Harvey. And regarding this event specifically, Hurricane Harvey is the second most studied event in the, in the SCR network. The most studied event happens to be Hurricane Katrina. And further elaborating on this, based on this geocoded map that I was able to obtain, the majority of Hurricane Harvey researchers are located located in the United States, United States, which isn't surprising since currently um, Hurricane Harvey is the most costliest disaster event in US history, and that still stands today. And it happened to be a major event with an American event, which obviously attracted American social scientists. However, there are a few in Oceania which happened to um, study this particular event. Regarding the researcher involvement of ESSER members, approximately 42% of ESSER members, they identified as core researchers, meaning that social scientists in the ESSER network, they happen to be regularly participating within the field and producing um, scholarship related to disaster studies. Almost a quarter of ESSER members identified as emerging researchers, 
this is just interesting to hear considering that before in previous literature there was a concern that there weren't going to be enough um, researchers in a new generation um, focusing on natural disasters so this kind of assuages concerns to the national research council and following this approximately 22 percent of ESSER members happen to be periodic researchers which is interesting considering um, the frequency of disaster events on a global scale and particularly in the United States. So while those, while some certain academics, they might not be particularly involved in disaster research, they just encountered the topic and decided that this was a major event and I might choose to study it. Um, following this, approximately 7.72% happen to be situational researchers. And regarding the last, um, 3.82%, we weren't able to locate the specific research and involvement of those SCM members. These happen to be my chi squares, which show a specific relationship between two specific variables. Um, regarding the first table, which focuses on the variables of research status and involvement. Um, I was able to obtain a p-value of 0, 0.000, and that, include, that means it's extremely statistically significant. And regarding um, researcher involvement and status, um, there's, a there's a close relationship between these two variables. And regarding core researchers, um, core researchers are more likely to identify as academic researchers than any other status. However, and this is typically the same for periodic and situational researchers. However, this differs among emerging researchers where they're more likely to identify as student researchers than any other status, which isn't surprising since emerging researchers kind of translate into being a student. Um, regarding discipline and researcher involvement, um, there's, a there's a close relationship between researcher involvement and the four disaster disciplines that I chose to examine for my project. Um, all researcher involvements except situational researchers were more likely to identify with the disaster discipline than not. Um, for situational researchers, they were more likely to not identify with the disaster discipline than not. And this shows that the academic background of situational researchers, it may diverge from the background of core emerging and periodic researchers, which could lead to a possible difference in how disaster scholarship is produced regarding the social sciences. Regarding um, my emphasis on hurricane research, um, all the, there's, there's a particular split difference between um, researchers who have never studied a hurricane and those who have not. However, there is a strong relationship indicated by the 0 0.000 um, p-value. Um, core researchers were more likely to have studied a hurricane than not. And however, this kind of differs among emerging researchers, periodic researchers, and situational researchers, where among all three of these groups, they're more likely to have never studied a hurricane than not. And this shows that regarding the educational and um, work backgrounds of core researchers, that core researchers may be more sensitive to the study of formal large events. And focusing on Hurricane Harvey, um, there's, all, there's a strong relationship between research involvement and having studied this particular hurricane event, where core researchers just focusing on having had study Hurricane Harvey, core researchers were more likely to have had study Hurricane Harvey than not in comparison to the other research involvement demographics. Focusing on my discussion, um, whenever we think about disaster research, I, I'm just reiterating the point that we think about the natural sciences and engineering. However, there is an ongoing shift where we're, we're trying to include all disciplines, which would result in transdisciplinary research. So society is able to benefit and from the findings of from the academic um, findings. 
And in regards to one of my findings where situational researchers were more likely to not identify with disaster disciplines than not, when we think about natural disasters from an American perspective, um, for instance, Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Sandy, Hurricane, Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Maria, these events had lasting impacts on, on our society and how we approach disasters and how we think about navig how we think about navigating um, the future in regards to natural hazard threats. And although researchers, they might not have a background or emphasis on studying disasters, we think about the collective memory of how such major disaster events, the sheer impact they have, they, they are often drawn into studying disasters, whether they want to or not, which happens to me a main focal point that I was able to discover within my project. And this is something that was an interesting tie-in to my project, considering um, one of my findings that the majority of ESTER members, they happen to be academic researchers. Um, considering the history of the United States, I tied into um, public institutions, specifically land-grant institutions in the United States. They were, they were founded during the Civil War by President Abraham Lincoln in regards to um, fostering um, a scholarship for the public benefit. However, the, um, the goal of the land, the land grant institutions have changed and they often have connections with public agencies and considering disaster scholarship and management and emergency management in the United States, we think about public agencies such as FEMA, NOAA, the National Weather Service, all these, these three specific agencies, they deal with um, handling disasters in the United States and when it comes to events, not only hurricanes, but other, other disaster events, there's a potential that land grant institutions, they have a greater opportunity because they have these connections with federal agencies that they often have the opportunity to produce more research connected to these disaster events. And that's a potential for future research to explore. Regarding the future directions, it will be pertinent to expand research connected to ESSER network members, considering that the ESSER network intends to be a census for all social scientists within the hazards and disaster field. And this includes employing qualitative research methods to gain more descriptive information regarding um, social scientists and the work that they complete, um, conducting geographical analysis, such as the one present in my um, presentation to Hurricane Harvey. So we can see that whether um, certain disaster events, they may attract researchers from a specific region or from a specific continent in terms like such as hurricanes or landslides, that's something to expand on in the future. And something that should also be incorporated happens to be higher levels of statistics, just regressions. So we have more qualitative, quantitative data and more information backed by empiricism. Um, regarding my presentation and my research project this summer, I'd like to thank um, my faculty mentor, Dr. Lori Peake. I'd also like to thank um, Dr. Robin Nelson for guiding me throughout the summer, alongside my graduate mentors, Heather Champo and Jessica Austin. I'd also like to thank my peer, Amina, for being such a kind friend throughout this program. Um, this summer, my project would not be possible without funding from the National Science Foundation. And I'd also like to recognize Converge at the University of Colorado Boulder for providing the data and resources necessary for my project. These are my references, and I'm here to take any questions that you have. I'm sure. So the question that was asked me in this room was how this, how the SCR um, network survey, how, how accessible is it basically? Uh, well, the survey is available for um, social scientists across the world. Like we have, it's still in its infancy. I think it's currently in its third year that it's been 
um, dispersed out. I think it's predominantly available in English, it's somewhat winged, limits its accessibility to social scientists. However, we had scientists from predominantly in the United States, but also from Europe, Asia, South America, um, Africa, who have completed it. And in the beginning, it was predominantly from social scientists connected to UC Boulder. However, in, its, in, in the following years, and hopefully they're hoping to expand this, to, um, to have it further disperse out and to, to gain more information about that. And the, yeah, it's all good. Oh, okay. So the question that was asked again in the room was um, whether S tier members they could um, have a specific overlap or select multiple disciplines, and that is correct. Like you can be a political science scientist and select decision making and risk analysis. There was an opportunity for S tier members in the survey to select multiple disciplines connected to their research and academic background. And regarding that, um, there's way more social science disciplines. Um, then I just then I focus on within my research project. I just chose these four um, due to like their application. Any more questions? So, Okay, um, another question that was asked in the room was um, elaborating on what um, the specific metrics of what it means to study a hurricane. Um, regarding that, um, it's really broad. Um, this is just something that I happen to examine and I want to go into greater detail. Um, within the ESSER network, people have studied, um, done sociological studies about the impacts of certain hurricanes. For some people, it's just some researchers, it's really broad. They, um, just the, the impact of hurricanes in general within a specific time frame. For some, it's specific hurricane events like Hurricane Maria, Hurricane Harvey. For some, it's hurricane impacts in a specific community. It's just meant to be really broad. I'm sure there's no, no problem. Um, so question that was asked was basically, were there any specific guidelines for um, guiding um, social scientists completing the ESSER survey, um, whether they should designate themselves as a core researcher or an emerging researcher? Um, during the course of the survey, there was an opportunity, like, if you're like a core researcher, you're regularly um, engaging in the field, you're regularly producing um, scholarship, you're going to conferences and that type of thing. But ultimately, it's like up to the researcher to self-select. But we still give that information out for saying like, you, you probably fit into this area if you meet um, these like metrics. No problem. Any more questions, please? Any more questions in the chat or? Okay, thank you guys so much. Hello everyone, my name is Chido Nikolu. My RU site was at University of Washington. I go to Howard University and my topic is about understanding the utility of the iPad LiDAR sensor. First of all, what is LiDAR? LIDAR is an acronym which stands for light detection and ranging. So the sensors in LIDAR emits light pulse waves to the surrounding environment. 
these waves bounce off the surrounding object and go back to the sensor. So the sensor uses the time it takes for each pulse to go back to the sensor to determine the total distance traveled. So if you keep on repeating this process, a 3D map of the environments will be created. And if you have an onboard computer, you can utilize this map for safe navigation. And that's how LiDAR keeps us safe. LiDAR also is used for self-driving cars, archaeology, buildings, and construction. This is a picture of LiDAR system. Sorry. Oops. This is a picture of the LiDAR system on top of the car, ready to scan. This is an image of the iPad Pro scanner. This is the LiDAR scanner beside the two cameras. So LiDAR, um, the iPad is capable of collecting 3D scans of various structures. However, the rapid facility haven't exploited the utility of the iPad LiDAR scanner. So the rapid wants to know how accurate it is when you scan structures. They also want to see if it's a portable alternative compared to other methods like terrestrial laser scanning and the RC360 scanning, which is time consuming and very expensive. So when a natural disaster occurs, how do we assess the building damage by collecting data? And that's what this research is about. This is an image of the drone LiDAR. This is Michael Grillo in the rapid, rapid facility. The drone is ready to scan the environment. The purpose of this research is to understand the effectiveness of the iPad LiDAR scanner. We also want to create a workflow so that rapid users can use when they're on the field. We also want to know how quickly the iPad LiDAR scanner creates a point cloud compared to other data collection methods. This is an image of me scanning with an iPad at the structural lab at the rapid facility in the University of Washington. Then the picture beside is me processing data using the software. The materials I use were the iPad Pro, which contains the application called Sitescape. Also use the measuring tape to measure the distance of the object. Also use a software called Cloud Compare. That's where you process and analyze the data. We also use the RTC360, which is a very high profile scanner, which is used to scan. We also use the register 360 to process the data. This is a picture of the iPad Pro with the measuring tape. This is an image of the RTC360 data being used after Hurricane Maria and the earthquake. So you can see the RTC360 device on top of the tripod. For methods, collect data using the Sitescape, collect using the Sitescape application, we export data on the Google Drive so you could download it. Then you import the downloaded data using the cloud compare software. You process and analyze the point clouds on the cloud compare. We also collect and process data using the RTC 360 device that we compare the iPad Pro and the LiDAR scanner, the iPad Pro and the RTC 360 device. This is a a, a picture of the Cloud Compare app. So this is it. And this is data I collected at the structural lab. So for my experimental design, my main focus was on small structures that had cracks. So the reason for this experiment was to know how the iPad was suitable for scanning. 
So we have this application called SciScape. It provides options to change parameters and it also allows us to export in a suitable format called E57. The application has settings called maximum detail. This allows you to scan in a small area that has a very high detail. Then we have the maximum area for a range of point densities that allow longer scanning time. Then we have the point size, which you use to control the size of the point cloud. They have the point density, which increases the scanning speed. So first we did a small experiment to determine the best settings for the SciScape application so that the rapid users won't be confused on which setting to use. If the point size should be low, if the point density should be high, if it should be a maximum detail or maximum area. So these is a, this is a picture of cracks that walk, the walkway that cracks outside my dorm. So from the left, this image, the setting for this image was had maximum detail, the point size and point density were both low. Then the one beside it had a maximum detail, the point size and point density were both high. Then, sorry. Then the third one had a maximum area and the point size and point density were both low. Then the fourth one had a maximum area and the point size and point density were both high. So from this picture, you can see that the second one, you can see the crack, the crack clearly, which means the settings, maximum detail and the point size and point density high, that's the best settings for when you scan the structure. Comparison between the RTC 360 and the iPad LiDAR sensor. First of all, what is RTC 360? It's a very high profile, accurate scanner which completes about two minutes. So it takes about two minutes to scan the structure. So you can see this is an image of the RTC 360. So this is data that was collected using the register 360 app. So you use the RTC device, you set it up and you collect the data. So you collect the data using the device, you import the 360 scan, then you create the links. You can see the red circle, they're linked together. This, um, I collected data twice, so they're linked um, together. So you improve the registration by aligning them together. So you have to make sure they fit together. Then you export the data and you save it as a E57 file. Registration process. So how you compare the RTC 360 and the iPad scan, you register them together using a software called Cloud Compare, which I mentioned earlier. So the left is the RTC 360 scan and the right is the iPad Pro scan. This is, this is the same structure. So on Cloud Compare, you hit tools to register, then you align them point pair picking there. So after that, you select equal data points. So this is an image of the RTC 360 device. You can see the points, there are four points here. So it's always good for you to do more than three points to improve the registration. So when you're done, you hit the green tick and you align them together. So this image, you can see the two scans being aligned together so they merge. You see the black, the gray RTC360 scan merged with the iPad scan. So after you register them together, you do a fine registration. So basically this fine registration, it tells you that, okay, you were close enough for the data picking, the, the point picking, but let me make it closer. So that's what it does. So it decreases registration error. So when you do the fine registration, this is the 
image you see. So after the define registration, I use the cross section tool to cut out some parts so you could see the main difference between the RTC 360 scan and the iPad Pro scan. So you could see the red data, which is the RTC 360 scan. You can see how smooth it is compared to the iPad. The iPad is more noisier because it's got the points, the cloud is scattered. You can see from the image here. So in cloud compare, you could measure so um, you can measure width, length of cracks. So that's what I did. So you click, sorry. So you um, go to the menu here. So you, um, somewhere here, so you click to measure the distance. So you can measure two points or three points. So for the RTC 360, I measured the length scan and it was about 0 0.07 meters. Then I now measured the width of the crack of the RTC 360 scan and it was about 0 0.002 meters. Then I now measured the length of the crack in the iPad Pro scan, which is about 0 0.07 meters. And I now measured the width of the crack of the iPad Pro scan, which is about 0 0.02 meters. So the results, the two scans were registered together successfully. So from the cross section to which I showed earlier, you could see that the RTC, three, RTC data is less noisy than the iPad, which means that the RTC PC is more precise and accurate. Then the width and the length of the RTC 360 and the iPad scans both had similar results, which means that they're both meticulous. So when scanning small structures, the iPad takes up to 10, 15 seconds in creating point clouds, while the RTC 360 takes up to two minutes. The iPad scanner could be used to scan small objects and could be able to measure quantities using the cloud compare software. For future research, I was able to determine the if the iPad scanner will be able to scan cracks in big structures. I also want to determine the width and length of the cracks in big structures and be able to compare the scans with the RTC 360 by registering them together on Cloud Compare. I want to thank the National Science Foundation for funding this research. I also want to thank my mentors. I want to thank um, Dr. Laura Lowe's, Dr. Jeffrey Berman, Dr. Michael Grillo, Andrew Lita, and the Rapid Facility for the support and guidance to this project. I also want to thank Dr. Robin Nelson for her support throughout the program. These are my references. Any questions? Do you think the iOS version of the iPad or the generation of the iPad could affect the results obtained? That's a very, very good question. I'm afraid I might have to get back to you on that because I'm not really sure if it does affect the results. Sorry about that, Chelsea. Yeah, the app is free to download it, it's free. Thank you, Kaylee. Any more questions? Did you encounter any battery or heat issue while using the iPad scanner? No, I didn't encounter any battery issue. Oh, well, don't you? Thank you, Mom. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hi, um, good morning. I am Dalin Torres. I'm from the University of Puerto Rico. 
and today I'll be presenting my summer research. Okay, so um, I'm from Puerto Rico and this summer I work with Dr. Harvey from the Oklahoma University. Um, he's an associate professor and also the principal investigator of the technology I researched in this summer. And I also work with the graduate mentor Esteban Villalobos Vega all the way from Costa Rica, who is a PhD student. So to begin, I'd like to first talk about the background and motivation behind this whole research. So as you all know, uh, we face various natural disasters. One in particular are the earthquakes and earthquakes engineers focus on, on um, working on the recovery phase. So they, they wanna find solutions that cut down the recovery phase uh, to a shorter time so that um, there are less economical losses. And one solution is in particular is called the um, isolation system. And so the specific technology I worked on this summer is called the rolling pendulum floor isolation system, which protects uh, critical equipment and hospitals and uh, computer servers. Um, and this is how it works. So you see these two frames, um, the bottom frame would stay fixed in the, uh, to the ground and the top frame along with the equipment will, would uh, slide on top of that frame. And so instead of having, for example, you can see the bolted cabinet image, instead of having this rocking motion and, and instead of having the equipment experience acceleration responses, that would otherwise be harmful to the equipment, it would slide about the bottom frame and if that would eliminate rocking and, and it would reduce the acceleration responses that would be otherwise harmful to, to the equipment. And so um, Dr. Harvey, uh, in order to understand it, the performance of this new technology and to, to implement it in, for the public, um, they wanna perform a real-time hybrid simulation on the floor isolation system. And this in particular helps out um, because it allows numerical modeling of complex system. So it's divided in two. It has an analytical substructure, which then that's where you build up a building, usually the model of a building. And you have the experimental substructure, which is the physical um, test portion in which you work with the components that's the most complex to model numerically. And so for the analytical substructure, you need to know what's the displacement response that the building is going to have during the seismic event. So for that characterization tests, um, need to be done on the floor isolation system. And my work in the summer was to um, help prepare the uh, multi-directional shake table that uses these actuators here, you can see on the, on the right side. And uh, sorry, it uses similar actuators. And, and so I did that by um, studying and validating its kinematics using Fusion 360 and preparing a preliminary test matrix. So prior to my research, another uh, postdoc student in the Lehigh University, and that, that was my facility where I worked, um, um, sorry, they worked on studying the kinematics of the multi-directional shake table. And this shake table in particular would move along the y-axis, uh, along the x-axis, and would have rotational movement. So all movements, and uh, this would allow you know, the shake table to have movements that are planar. And so he, um, the postdoc student, um, Dr. Lian Gao, he developed um, this kinematic diagram and defined it as the actuator A, actuator B, actuator C. 
And after deriving the kinematic equations using geometry, he created a MATLAB script that would give you the actuator displacement when you would input the new coordinates that you want the uh, shape table to move to. And after he created this, um, he validated it using AutoCAD. So he drew the uh, 2D, um, a 2D drawing of the shape table in AutoCAD and he would position it differently each time um, by uh, changing the, the coordinate of the center of the shape table and measure the new actuator length. So the, and my job in particular was to do this in a 3D environment with the software called Fusion 360. So now I'll be focusing more on what I did this summer. So starting off with the shake table 3D model. So first, as, as you'll know, I use Fusion 360. I used the sketch tool to create the shape of the object and the extrusion tool to give it get, give the object depth. And I repeated this for um, all of the components of the shake table until um, I had all the components and I assembled them into this model. So in here you can see uh, a model of the three actuators the shape table, the isolation system, and the 3,000 um, pound payload. And so, and these three strength points um, allow the top of the isolation system to stay fixed during the test. And the bottom portion, which is the shape table and the bottom plate of the isolation system would move, move along during the test. And I was able to um, animate it using joints. So we have the Y direction, X direction, and we have the rotational direction. So after I created the Fusion 360 model, I went over the 10 cases um, the uh, Dr. Liang Kao had studied prior um, and validated on AutoCAD. And so I, I compare it using uh, Fusion 360. So for example, this is this image in particular, which um, this case, um, the case eight, I selected because it was the most um, extreme case. Um, for this case, you would input the negative two in, y, in the X direction, positive two in the Y direction and negative 30 in the degree and in the MATLAB script. And so, that MATLAB um, would output these three actuator strokes, um, 5.6, 1.01, 1 .01, 17.6. And then what I would do is I would change the, the position of the shake table in my 3D model, and I would measure the, uh, the new length using the measure tool. And I compared the Fusion 360 actuator stroke with the MATLAB results uh, using error percentages. And there were much less than 1%, which implied that the kinematics behind the MATLAB scripts and the equation were all validated. And this is a visualization of the Fusion 360 actuator stroke. And this in particular, it was interesting to see that for some cases, um, some actuators have a variety of, of displacement, some were in the positive, some were in the negative displacement. So that was pretty curious to see uh, during my research. And so now I'm going to, to be talking about the preliminary test matrix I created. I first worked on um, helping select a preset set of motions that the shape table would, would go about during the test. And for example, if you can see this um, circular orbit, the, sh the center of the shape table would start at the, at the very center of the graph, and then it would transition off to the first circle you, you would see and the shape table would move along that first circle for, for four cycles until moving off to the transitional path up, up to the next circle and so on until this, uh, reaching the desired amplitude. 
And this was pretty, pretty similar for the figure eights cases, for the square cases. And this below, it would just move um, back and forth. And so to ensure that these um, didn't cost something that the shake table, the actuators um, would go above its limit, um, I, I explored various parameters to, to make sure that this doesn't happen. And so you can see here in, the, in each graph, you can see the, the dotted lines that have uh, different colors. So for example, the circular shape is the bearing limit, and which was about eight, um, eight inches. And you have the actuator limit, which um, the maximum um, limit was either seven plus inches or seven minus inches. And to do this, I used the MATLAB script to import the motion data into, into the script and get the actuator's displacements um, and velocity. And once I had those, I was able to compare that information with the actuator capacity I got from the manufacturer. And this case, in this graph in particular, you can see that this is a case where the velocity exceeded the, the capacity of the actuator. So it was not included in the um, test matrix. And so I did this for um, various parameters um, such as um, amplitude, velocity, and frequency. This is the preliminary test matrix. So it has three uh, different types of tests. The first are quasi-static tests, which are tests that are very low in frequency. And you have um, one directional test. You have a uh, circle, circular tests, which only test uh, one, just one circle. You have rotational tests and a uh, rectangle test. There's also the sine wave tests that test out just a single degree of freedom. So just uh, X direction or Y direction and uh, rotation. And of course, we have the, the set of motions that I just described a few slides back, which is which are the control displacements. We have the circular rotations, the uh, figure eights, and the rectangular um, orbits. And so after I did the preliminary test matrix, I got 14 cases um, using the parameters and the orbits from that table. And I did the same thing as before. You know, this is uh, case six. Uh, I moved the shape table negative four inches in the X direction, four plus inches in the Y direction, and minus five in degree. And so you can see here that the results in error percentages were much lower, which um, is pretty consistent with my finding with the other cases, which means that the kinematics was validated for the multi-directional shape table. This is another graph. And in this one, I found particularly uh, curious that um, actuator B and C were pretty similar to each other. And I think that it's one of the reasons it's because they're pretty close to each other. And so it makes sense why this would happen for some cases. To conclude, um, to conclude, I had a successful validation of the kinematics of the shake table using a 3D CAT software. This had only been previously done with a 2D CAT software. Um, I was successful in creating a test matrix with the proper parameters. And this will help to advance the actuator control system that will be used for future tests that will in turn help, uh, help us understand the performance of the floor isolation system. And having a 3D computer model opens up the possibility of comparing the uh, possible computational simulations and kinematics and dynamics with the physical test um, using imaging and sensors. 
unfortunately, due to due to time constraints, um, we weren't able to perform the characterization test. So in the future, uh, physical validation of the kinematics will be done, as well as uh, the characterization tests and data processing. And this would all be to prepare everything for the multi-directional real-time hybrid simulation test for the system. Um, I'd like to thank uh, my mentors, Dr. Harvey, Esteban Villalobos Vega, Dr. Cao, Dr. Rickles, um, Dr. Cusco. I also like special thanks to Dr. Nelson for organizing this event and always reaching out and giving us support. I'd also like to thank um, Dr. Karina Vienma and Thomas Marulo. And just this quick slide, I wanted to share um, how appreciative I am of this whole experience. Um, I met great people and I just, I saw the beautiful nature around Pennsylvania. And on that note, um, thank you for your time. And are there any questions? If I ever figure out what? The transmission, transmissibility ratio. Okay, so I was just asked if um, I was able to uh, work on um, studying the transmissible ratio. Uh, my my answer is like unfortunately no. Um, it was mainly focused in the the kinematics, of uh, and motion. Uh, thank you. Okay, so they asked them about the what the to elaborate more on the test matrix. So the test matrix basically describes the specific types of tests that the characterization will go over because to do before before performing a test, you need to create a MATLAB script, sorry, a MATLAB um, data that has the information for the actuators to move. And so this taste test matrix was created um, specifically for that purpose so that the person could go to the MATLAB script, generate that data with those specific parameters and they'll know for what purpose it is. Yeah, so they asked about um, how the isolation system works with, with the sliding off. Um, so these, let me present the, the image. So, right, you can see it in the isolation system, it has um, points of where there are bearings and they have steel bowls. And these have actually uh, concave dishes that allow the ball to roll back and forth. And so um, let me, yes. So the dish is sort of like this, just like this is an exaggerated version and the ball is here. And then if it slides off and it, it finishes off here in this point, um, because of the return returning force, it'll slide by, back down. And there are also like special kinds of padding that this system has um, that allows this to, to occur. Um, any more questions?
Thank you. That's my sister. <laughs> okay. Well, um, thank you for your time and thank you for those questions. These are just the net peak pressure coefficients from each pressure sensor, just to show you that this is the data that was used to get the area averaged graph that was shown in the slide before. All of this data was collected in a 15 minute period or 900 seconds. So that's what's shown in the graph in seconds. So yes, um, the pressure coefficients that we calculated using the ASCE and the pressure coefficients we got from doing the C from analyzing the CWU data were in agreement because they were both done using small scale testing. So we were supposed to be getting those exact results. And basically we did our, the solar array at CWU just kind of like to verify that the FIU results would be um, accurate just because part of what FIU is doing is ASCE doesn't cover full scale testing and it doesn't really account for any of the vibrational dynamic effects. So we want to kind of start studying that so that maybe it could potentially be added into the ASCE. Um, yeah, so the largest um, pressure coefficient was observed in sensor seven. I would show you, but I'm afraid that the PowerPoint is gonna get stuck again on that slide that was having trouble. <laughs> But um, at CWU, since the array was just on a rooftop and not in front of simulated winds, um, the direction that the wind was blowing for most of the time was about at a uh, 320 degree angle um, in relation to the array. And I think I said earlier, the mean wind speed was about 15 um, miles per hour at CWU. And yeah, due to time constraints, the FIU field data was not able to be analyzed but I went over how once it is, it'll make waves in studying how these vibrational effect, uh, vibrational dynamic effects really affect PV arrays and how we can better build PV arrays that can withstand these effects, making using solar energy more reliable. So these are my references. And I wanna give, um, I want to acknowledge NSF for funding this project, and I want to give a big thank you to Dr. Arundam Ganchaudhary, um, Johnny Estefan, and Robin Nelson for helping me throughout this entire time. I learned a lot this summer, and I'm excited to learn more. Thank you. Um, if anybody has any questions? All right, thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Mariana Marrero. I'm from the University of Puerto Rico. And during the summer, I was part of the FIU program at the Wall of Wind. So codification of wind-induced loads on low-rise irregular-shaped buildings. Wait. OK. So as we already know, a lot of hurricanes and extreme wind events hit the US on an annual basis and have caused billions of dollars in damages. And that could be avoided in the structures. The damaging structures could be avoided, sorry. Okay, so only a few studies have been done on how these wind loads affect the regular shaped structures. Most of them are based on regular shaped buildings like rectangular or squared houses. But with new building materials, construction techniques, and an advancement in technology, the shapes of structures have become more complex. That's why it's so important to study these new irregular shaped houses like all shaped, C shaped, U shaped, to see how these wind induced loads affect them and the pressure distribution that they face. <clears throat> so, Stephanie already mentioned this, but the Neary Wall of Wind is a full, large-scale experimental facility made of, a, of 12 fans, as you can see in the picture. And it can simulate open, suburban, and uniform terrain exposures 
and it can be used for multi-scale testing. <clears throat> so during the summer, because of operating costs and electrical demands, um, uh, an atmospheric boundary layer wind tunnel was built, and it's a smaller scale wind tunnel. As you can see in the picture, it is 19 feet, 19 feet long and eight feet width by six feet of height. There's a turntable in this part of the wind tunnel that has a diameter of 7.5 feet. And the models were placed in that turntable. So these are the parts of the wind tunnel. These are the two fans that were used that are on the other side of the wind tunnel. These, this is a turntable with a model in the middle. And the spires and baseboards and roughness elements basically simulate buildings or trees or other things that wind has to go through before hitting a structure like a house. And in this, in the middle of the turntable, we can see the wind field testing rig. The, these COVID probes basically measure the wind speed at different heights. And the rigs are to avoid vibrations that the structures could face, could obtain, yeah. <clears throat> we used five models. The rectangular model was the basis, if we got the name. But we, we used that one to compare it with the other models. These, these were scaled to a one to 100 scale. And every model had from 330 to 360 pressure caps, like 350 average. And they, the pressure caps were put on the walls and roofs, walls and roofs of the models. Hmm. These are the other four models that were used. The first one is the T-shaped model. The second one is the L-shaped model. The third one is the S-shape and the C-shape. The one with the most pressure taps would be the S shape, just because it's the biggest one. All right, so before we could do any testing, we had to do an area averaging. So these are AutoCAD um, models. This is a Model T sidewall. The combinations could be of two, three, and four. They had to be adjacent. For example, you can make a combination of one, two, or two, three. And if it was a combination of four, it had to be one, two, and six, seven, and so on. If it were a roof, it could, instead of 44, it could be combinations of 40. And for this area averaging, you can make a scatter plot. This scatter plot will tell you if there are um, mistakes in the pressure tab. For example, we found a mistake in pressure tab 34 and 35 because 35 was too close to the sidewall, to the corners of the sidewall. So we used MATLAB to basically make a code and uh, substitute the other pressure tab. So instead of 34, 35, it would be 33, 34. You following? Yes, okay. <laughs> um, so the testing protocol. So here we can see the turntable basically, and the models were put in the center, so where it says model and wind and turbulence intensity profile for open terrain was at a one to 100 scale. And the wind speed for the fans was 10 meters per second. Uh, the fans were put at 50% throttle at 15 degree increments going from zero degrees to 345 degrees. And each model was put in a one minute duration. All right, so the pressure coefficients. So. The pressure taps obtain scan of all readings, but they're not a concrete number for sure. Like you need to find these pressure coefficients. So delta P is basically the difference between the static pressure and the pressure obtained from the pressure taps. And then you would divide it by air density and the wind speed. Um, it's important to mention that pressure coefficients are a dimensionless number. So you can basically turn these numbers into a full scale models because you don't have um, dimensions basically. 
And the numbers, the most important pressure coefficients that were used were the mean, were the mean ones. I mean, we found the minimum and maximum, but the ones that we used were the were the contour plots that we're gonna talk about were the mean pressure coefficients. Uh, also, you can make time histories of 60 second intervals with the with one pressure tab. You can make combinations of pressure tabs, but here we only have one pressure tab of the windward wall on the rectangular model. Um, here you can basically just confirm that the maximum is 1.03. The minimum is negative 0 0.72 and the mean is 0 0.062. <clears throat> so the contour plots, these are basically the results. Uh, how to make the contour plots, you basically just put the mean pressure coefficients that you found in here compared to the X and Y the angles. This is a contour plot from Excel. It wasn't the prettiest one, so I just sent it to my mentor so we could use another application and create this one, which is prettier. Um, so the most important thing to know about contour plots is that the red, uh, no, the orange means it's positive, while the blue means it's negative. Uh, what this means that basically when wind hits the wall, it's a positive pressure force. This is because comparing to the static force, the surrounding static force, it will be positive. And then the corners or sidewalls, sidewalls receive a high suction force, which it's basically a negative force. <clears throat> so irregular shaped structures have more corners than rectangular houses. So that's why it's so important. Uh, this is basically how the positive and negative pressures work. Here, because it's pushing the wall, it will be positive. And then when it goes through the corner upwards, it, it's separating, so it becomes negative. So that's basically how it works, the flow separation. <clears throat> and a conclusion. So what we learned here is that irregular shaped houses are more susceptible to damages from extreme wind events because they have a larger amount of corners and these corners are high suction forces. Uh, and uh, essentially corners are critical zones because of it. Um, each of the models underwent relatively high pressures and got affected differently. And this research can be used to give recommendations on current housing standards we only use five models, so you can't really just change housing standards because of it. It's a, an ongoing process. These are preliminary results, but it could be helpful for, for the near future. And my acknowledgement, I want to thank my mentors, Manuel Matus and Dr. Ayani Sisis and Dr. Robin Nelson and the NSF for funding and the Wall of Rights FIU. Questions, Chelsea. <laughs> well, plexiglass. To my understanding, uh, uh, she asked if the material if it affected the models. Um, to my to my understanding, it doesn't because we were investigating the pressure coefficients, so it doesn't really matter what the building is made of. Right, if the, but I mean, if you make a study about the material, maybe. But to my understanding, it doesn't. For this study, it doesn't. The material does not matter. Any other questions? No. Okay. Got it. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tomas Angel, and this summer I was fortunate enough to go to the University of Florida for two weeks and a bunch of research for them. And my research topic was higher order turbulence in a boundary layer wind tunnel. All right, so a little introduction. So this study for the most part seeks to establish whether or not turbulence intensity and these are sufficient parameters to replicate wind profiles. And whenever I mean profile, 
whenever I say profile, I more so mean a function relative to the height within the wind tunnel here on this end, on the test section, compared to the whatever parameter we're deciding. So on the top right, you can see a min, mean wind speed comparison. And more so, we're looking into whether or not that's the most accurate representation of a wind profile. So we're looking at other second order statistical analysis methods, such as integral length scale, and also higher orders, so skewness and equivalence. Also to see if only using mean wind speed and turbulence intensity is enough, or if skewness and kurtosis would also be equivalent in different wind profiles. All right, so I said a lot of terms there. So just explaining them real quick. Turbulence intensity is essentially the standard deviation divided by mean wind speed. And I mentioned turbulence length scale. So that's essentially represented here on the right. This is an autocorrelation function. And the way I think about this is the bottom is time and the top is the left is more so probability. So the way I think about it is if it's raining right now in 0 0.001 seconds, you'll be able to tell that it's likely that it'll still be raining. And this is useful because you're able to find the average length of a wind gust within the wind tunnel while it's passing by the gantry system that's collecting all the data. And there's two methods of doing this. One's by integration, which is essentially you integrate from zero to, in this case, 0 0.82. And that area you multiply by the mean wind speed and it'll give you your integral length scale. And the other method is exponential assumption, which is assuming that this is an exponential function. And so you find about where the function is equal to one over the exponential of one. And you multiply this specific point in this, <laughs> in this specific case by the mean wind speed again, and you get the exponential assumption length scale. And the skewness is the asymmetric deviation from the Gaussian distribution, better known as the bell curve, normal curve. And the kurtosis is the symmetric deviation from the Gaussian. So the skewness is the third order and the kurtosis is the fourth order, hence the higher order analysis. All right, so some quick background. So within that civil engineering, wind engineering community, for the most part, terminal intensity and mean wind speeds are what's used. And so they're also used when it comes to designing. That's why it's so important. When designing a structure, you wanna know what loads to expect and be able to replicate those loads in a different wind tunnel so you can test different configurations on your structure and have the same variables at play. And also for the record, those wind speeds don't necessarily change what's coming out by wind speed. I mean, what's coming out of the fan. So the fan's consistently blowing 15 miles per meters per second wind. And that doesn't change. What changes is the roughness elements seen in the figure Can't see up here, right there, they're at zero. I'll talk about that in a little bit. So you might be asking yourself, why are we talking about statistical analysis just now, these higher order? You should hypothetically be able to do this a long time ago. But unfortunately, most researchers haven't been able to look into it because it's a timely process because you have to continuously change the size of the, ter the roughness elements. And manually, that's usually how it's done in most boundary layer wind tunnels. But at University of Florida, they were able to automate it. So in about 90 seconds, they're able to change the height of 1,116 different roughness elements to any configuration they want. And they're able to collect different data by relocating the COBRA probes every 30 seconds. So they're able to do stuff that other wind tunnels would take months on and weeks. All right, so now on to the materials and instrumentation. So as previously mentioned, the terraformer, pretty important part of my research, 1,116 different roughness elements. The gantry system with these three support systems <laughs> and the Cobra probes here collecting the mean winds, the different wind speeds, and also the eight AeroVent 54D5 VJ Vent axial fans located here in the back that blow the wind, that blow the wind into the wind tunnel, and also the Irwin spires that allow for more accurate turbulence to what's actually experienced in nature. 
All right, so now onto the methods. So from here on out, I'll be referencing a baseline. So by baseline, I mean all of the terraformers are set to 80 millimeters, all 1,116 of them, all set to the exact same height. And that's essentially what we're gonna try and find something to be equivalent to. That's the baseline. So you end up finding the turbulence intensity and the mean wind speed of that. You put that into MATLAB and you can create a cool figure like the one here on the top right, uh, the black dots, the black dotted line. And also you get to decide, you have to decide what parameters you want to select to determine the equivalence. So in this case, we use plus or minus the third standard deviation. So like that we have a 99% certainty whether or not it's equivalent or not equivalent. All right, so now onto the method. So previously I mentioned the odd correlation function, integral length scale, all that good stuff. So our first step was comparing that to the turbulence intensity. And what we figured out very quickly was that the turbulence intensity was much more selective. And so from here on out, we ended up just using the turbulence intensity because the length scale was kind of a waste of time to keep using. And so onto the methods now. So now you gotta calculate the skewness and the kurtosis of the baseline, the original 25 all eight millimeter roughness elements. And you create the exact same plus or minus three standard deviation equivalence method with the red dotted line. And now onto the methods and to the experiment. So I mentioned the baseline now onto the actual experiment. So the roughness elements are now decided to be, we chose to make them not uniform essentially trying to make a non-uniform pattern seen as the top right image, similar to the one that was all equivalent roughness element amplitudes. And we did that by using a sine wave configuration. So for the most part, we played around with different amplitudes and wave numbers as seen in the bottom right example of one of the profiles we decided to use. And we ended up making all the terraformer roughness elements mimic the waves we made. And this allowed us to also organize a parameter space where we could compare all of them side by side, which we'll get to in a few. All right, so now we have to decide whether or not it's equivalent or not equivalent. That is a lot less black and white as one might expect. You have to organize and schedule, decide how many of these blue dots you're okay with being outside of the standard deviation red dotted line. In this case, it's this specific profile 106 definitely is an equivalent, as you could tell. And so now we put it into the parameter space with the wave numbers down here and the amplitude of each roughness element. And this essentially puts them all in level playing field. You're able, you're able to see them all together in one place. You're able to score whether or not it was within the bound field limits for its standard deviation above or below or not. And you do this separately for turbulence intensity, skewness, and kurtosis, as previously mentioned. And now on to some of the results. So this was not, this was one of the results where we didn't allow any of the blue dots outside of the red dotted line. And here you could compare the terminal intensity top left, the skewness top right, and the kurtosis bottom left. The same, met the same legend as before, X is not equivalent, circle is equivalent. And this is for none allowed outside. This is for two allowed outside. 5 allowed outside, and 10 allowed outside. So something you may or may not have noticed, I went through that kind of quickly, was that for the most part, as you start loosening the parameters, more and more are deemed equivalent. So when looking at the most strict, here is none allowed, the first one we looked at, you're able to see that for the most part, the turbulence intensity was what was the most selective. It rejected the most of the one profiles. And from there, that's a pretty good indicator that that's the best method. So they've been, the wind engineering community has been right this whole time. And there was one exception, however, as seen by the arrows, this one point in the parameter space, sorry, was equivalent in the terminal's intensity, not equivalent in the skewness and equivalent in the kurtosis, which was kind of what we were looking and hoping to see more of, but unfortunately just one case this time. And so looking at that one exception, out of the 20 different wind profiles, we were only able to find that one case of skewness being more selective in one specific scenario than the turbulence intensity. And that was specifically in profile 128. And the naming 
So it was an amplitude of 10.17 millimeters and the wave number of a positive 1.95. So the conclusion now, it appears that the terminal's intensity and the mean wind speed profile have been accurate methods of analysis from what we found, but definitely not conclusive entirely information. It was only 20 experiments that we were able to analyze and something that future research should look into. If we had more time this summer, we would have, but unfortunately only 10 weeks was to potentially look at how this specific exception would potentially create different wind loads on a structure placed inside of the wind tunnel relative to something, one of the parameters that was equivalent across such as this one, that was equivalent in TI, kurtosis, and skewness. It would've been cool. All right, acknowledgements. Thank you to the NSF for funding Summer's research. Thank you to Dr. Gurley and Marielle for meeting with me at very unconventional hours, early mornings, late nights, getting things done. Thank you to Dr. Nelson for keeping me motivated and reminding me that I was capable of doing all the research. And thank you for, to Lehigh University, my home institution for some statistical background, which helped a lot. And University of Florida for hosting me this summer for a week and a half and allowing me to use a lot of their data. And thanks to my parents, Muchas gracias, Ama, y Apa. Lots of thanks, mom and dad. And lots of friends, lots of thanks to friends too. I got my mind off the research when I didn't have to do the research. And these are my references. And thank you. Any questions? All right. So initially he asked me what the most challenging part of the summer was and or this project. And I mentioned how it was the creating the contour maps. And he also asked whether or not I had some prior experience with this. I had some statistical background at Lehigh. I took the civil engineering statistical course, but that was a half semester course that was meant to be a full semester. So it was kind of rushed. So I definitely got a lot more knowledge this time around. And yeah. Thank you to listening how I spent my summer. Hi, everyone. I'm um, glad to see most of y'all are awake uh, for the last presentation. And uh, I want to thank Robin to begin with for saving the best for last. Um, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I just had to open with a joke. Um, so yeah, my project, uh, I'm Aditya Nair. I am a junior or a rising senior at The Ohio State University um, studying civil engineering. And I had the privilege of um, joining the Sim Center this summer um, at Cal. And my project is titled Uncertainty Analysis of Seismic Soil Liquefaction Using the QOFIM Application. Right, sweet. Yeah, so an introduction to what liquefaction is. So liquefaction is a soil phenomenon that occurs when um, loose and saturated soil, usually sand, um, goes through some sort of external stimuli, such as earthquake shaking, and because of water present in the soil, um, filling the voids in between the grains, um, it causes the soil to expand and behave like a liquid. And that's been explained a couple of times. So I'm sure you guys get it by now. Um, and currently FE or finite element analysis with uh, well calibrated constitutive soil models um, are used to adequately assess the risk that comes from this uh, phenomenon. And within these models, it's crucial to estimate the parameters and their uncertainty. And this is a map that shows some of the liquefaction prone areas in the United States. Most is uh, concentrated on the West Coast, as you can see, but there are areas um, on the East as well. Yeah, so research objectives. So this is a flow chart that kind of demonstrates the whole you know, process as a whole. Uh, so part one, uh, this is actually a picture I took um, at my university's uh, geotechnical engineering lab. And it's a direct simple shear test machine. Um, so that was meant to show that we are calibrating our models to simulate experimental data uh, as well as possible. Um, and the image below it, uh, which says SSP quad four node, um, that is the element type that these uh, soil models use to uh, simulate displacement and stress and strain loading, and uh, it's run through open seas. 
So from the experimental data and these models, uh, we do some analysis and those uh, two plots in the second column are um, hysteresis or stress strain curves. Um, and from that, the last uh, graph that has two figures on it, that's a simulation and experiment. Um, the goal of the project is to see if we can get those curves to be exactly equal to each other. Um, and uh, this is just an example. So this, don't worry about what's going on with these two curves as it is. It's just shown for demonstration. Um, and those three, uh, I guess, words at the bottom are the parameters that I calibrated uh, for the soil model, which I'll explain further. And the final step is assessing risk using a column of soil that has elements as well. So process flow. Um, Within uncertainty analysis, there are three basic steps. So it starts with sensitivity analysis, uh, which is a process that determines the influence of parameters on the outcome of a soil model um, and kind of tells you or highlights which parameters are trivial or non-trivial. Uh, Bayesian calibration is then used uh, to actually determine probabilistic ranges or values of the parameters um, and their uncertainty. And then we propagate that uncertainty and those values through some type of model. Um, in our case, like I mentioned before, it's a soil column um, and see whether, assess whether liquefaction or lateral spreading occurs. So the software we use. So obviously um, the goal of this project was to demonstrate the capabilities of the CoFlim application. So that was used and that picture kind of shows what the homepage looks like. Um, the data sets for uh, experimental data was um, obtained from UC Davis, uh, their centrifuge facility at CGM. Um, and then PM4 sand is the constitutive model that was used to, um, it's the material model that's used to demonstrate how the sand behaves. And then there's that um, 1D uh, tri-layer sand column model as well. And all of this is modeled using scripts and Jupyter Networks. Oh, I forgot. The uh, PM4 sand model, which is, um, which undergoes sensitivity analysis and Bayesian calibration has 22 total parameters, but there are three main input parameters that we focused on, uh, relative density, uh, shear modulus factor, and contraction rate. Yeah, so the methodology. Um, first, we pre-processed pre the experimental data from the CGM facility at UC Davis. Uh, there wasn't a lot that went into the step, but there was a bit of organization that had to be done um, in order to prepare it. Then we prepared the model scripts and other necessary files, which included like the text files that had the experimental data, some past calibration data um, for input into CoFem. So there was a bit of tweaking that needed to go on with them. And then, like I mentioned before, we performed sensitivity analysis to determine the influence of uh, certain parameters on PM4 SAN. Um, and we'll see what the SOPL indices mean, but that's how you measure how sensitive they are. Uh, then with Bayesian calibration was uh, performed to determine the values of those parameters and then forward propagation assessed lateral spreading in the soil column. So what did we find? Um, so yeah, for sensitivity analysis, uh, we had previous calibrations completed at uh, CGM, like I mentioned uh, by Dr. Ziatopolo and Dr. Boulanger. And they used a power law fit to fit their CSR versus number of cycles to liquefaction, which is the main output we're looking at in this project. And uh, this is, so basically we did a small stub study into the power law itself. So this is the simple one we use. It's just AX to the power of negative B. Um, so I just looked at what would happen uh, to various CSR curves um, if you varied A and if you varied B. Um, and I like to point out that those are plotted on a log log plot. So both the X and Y axes are, axes are on log scale. So that's why they're linear. Um, and we found that varying A, um, or increasing A just translates the graph up and uh, increasing B just um, increases the slope negatively. Um, yeah, and then this panel on the right is the inputs that we used for sensitivity analysis. So we have uh, parent relative density, uh, shear modulus factor and contraction rate. And then we had two other uh, input parameters that we thought would be uh, wise to consider uh, that are also used in pm 4 sand uh, which is NB and ND. Um, and we inspected them because they have an effect on uh, the slope of that power law fit. 
yeah, and then this is the main uh, output that we got, and this is graphed in uh, Excel on tornado diagrams. Um, so what are the main findings? Um, first of all, I, I guess I should start off by saying there's a total and a main Sobel index, um, and the main index just assesses the sensitivity of that one parameter uh, by itself, and then the total also takes into account the interactions between parameters, uh, between other parameters as well. And we found that DR appears to be the dominant random variable um, for its effect on number of cycles to liquefaction and on A. Um, HP naught also has some effect, and that makes sense because the value of HP naught is uh, dependent on DR. Um, and then we found that G naught, uh, shear modulus, does not have much of an effect um, on number of cycles to liquefaction. And also, even though we hypothesized that NB and ND would have an effect on the slope, it also had just very minimal effect. Yeah, and calibration. So this table shows the results of the manual calibration performed at UC Davis, as well as the Bayesian calibration uh, performed using QOFM. Um, so those are our values. And it also shows the standard deviation for the values in QOFM. Um, and it's good because the manual uh, calibration from UC Davis already produced a very adequate fit, and uh, ours are similar to their values. Uh, but, our, but obviously, Bayesian calibration is a lot better than the manual calibration they use because um, we can reduce uncertainty uh, in DR. And if you can see in the pairwise plot on the right, um, this shows the distribution. So in Bayesian calibration, you start out with a prior probability density function, or PDF. Um, and then the algorithm reassigns probabilities uh, based on you know, how it influences the outcomes on uh, the quantities of interest. And then you get something called a posterior PDF. Um, so the orange denotes the posterior. And as you can see, it really reduced the range of um, DR only because the sensitivity analysis proved that uh, DR had a significant effect on the outcome. So Bayesian calibration did most of its work on that. Um, and then the additional uh, conclusion that we made was, if you can see on the top right and bottom left subplots, there's almost an exponential fit to uh, DR versus HP naught. So we found out that they appear to be dependent on each other. And that was confirmed. So continuing from that, I mentioned those prior and posterior functions. So the goal of Bayesian calibration is to um, quantify the uncertainty and um, actually reduce it. So the blue area in this uh, left figure shows um, the distribution of certain samples from the prior. So predictions from the prior, as we say. Um, and then the red area are the predictions from the posterior. And the solid black curve denotes the experimental data that we're trying to emulate. Um, and as you can see, it looks like, so the previous calibration is also denoted by that dotted black line. Um, it shows that um, or the mean of our posterior prediction from our Bayesian calibration is, is very well fit to um, the experimental data. And it's uh, obviously better uh, than the prior predictions as well. And then the figure on the right is just a snap, a closer look into the posterior itself. Uh, so the same thing. So it was effective in reducing the uncertainty in the prediction of number of cycles to liquefaction. So that's great. Um, and like I said, this is evidenced by the smaller bounds for that red area. Um, so yeah, Bayesian calibration was effective as a process. In quote and forward propagation. So we ran, uh, knowing that we have these calibrated parameter values, um, we ran five different cases of forward propagation uh, where we used different numbers of random variables. So the first case we used the three primary inputs, uh, relative density, shear modulus, and contraction rate with the posterior um, sample values. Uh, then we added grade, so a grade to the column between 0 and 3% as a random variable. And then we also made the liquefiable layer or the blue layer, layer 2 uh, variable as well. And then we took away grade, and then we used the uh, main input values from the prior distribution as well. And these are actually the PDFs of lateral spreading. So lateral spreading is what we're measuring in terms of liquefaction. Um, and it's how much the soil column displaces to one side or the other. Um, and what we found was that the introduction of each new random variable introduced more uncertainty into the prediction for uh, lateral spreading, uh, which makes sense, but this was a good confirmation of it. Um, and it can be seen that uh, the posterior distribution of the three primary input parameters 
uh, leads to a narrower shape of the PDL. So that's the two plots on the right. So the second and the fourth plot, um, which is case one is plotting the uh, posterior and case five is plotting the prior. So it can, it's seen that it's, it leads to a much narrower and uh, tighter distribution with a smaller standard deviation. And then these are the um, profiles that geotechs um, are really interested in. So these are the vertical displacement profiles um, for cases one, two, and five. Um, and this shows um, displacement over the entire um, height of the column. And you can see that with, in case two, with the introduction of grade, um, the range of the possible displacement curves increases from case one. Um, and in case five, the displacements are quite ridiculous. I mean, there's some that are between 7.5 and 10. I think the max value was 10, 10 meters. Um, and the column is only six meters in height. So um, that makes sense, but uh, it goes to show you how effective Bayesian calibration is in reducing the uncertainty. Sorry for that interruption. Phone was acting out. Um, yeah, so back on track. Uh, we also performed a sensitivity analysis for the uh, soil column model itself to assess the random variables that uh, were there. Um, so we found out that when grade was introduced, it was the dominant random variable for lateral spreading. And that makes sense because when you apply a preset grade, um, it and shaking occurs, it will, you know, it will increase the lateral spreading and it makes sense. Uh, and when layer thickness was made a random variable as well, uh, layer two thickness, it also had a significant effect. Um, and interestingly, uh, DR doesn't seem to have an effect when those two other random variables are introduced, um, unlike the uh, PM4 sand model. Um, and because of, um, if you can see from this that G naught now has a higher Sobel index, uh, main and total than DR, there might, it, we might need to perform a new calibration to um, satisfy and determine the influence of G naught on um, forward propagation in the soil column. Yeah, and this is showing the uh, Sobel indices for the top node. And you can see that G naught is way more influential than the other. So, yeah, so concluding, um, POFEM was very, very successful in uh, completing these three analyses in a very, very streamlined and efficient manner. Um, and uh, to reiterate what we found in sensitivity analysis, we found that DR was the most influential input parameter for a number of cycles. And in calibration, we found that dependency between DR and HP naught that we saw from that pairwise plot. Um, and then we know from this that the calibrated parameters were used to predict uh, risk of uh, Earthquake-induced lateral spreading in the soil column, and we found, like I said a little bit ago, that the addition of each um, new random variable increased the uncertainty in that prediction. So, future topics: uh, we can analyze deeper soil profiles um, at depths that normal borehole data um, would not be available for. So, for example, the earth underneath a 200-meter dam, which is you know happens a lot, and we have constructed a lot um, in forward propagation, maybe a, a model that has multiple. Um, liquefiable layers instead of just one. Um, and finally, a predictive equation for lateral spreading uh, could be developed using some data and relationships between the input parameters themselves. Um, and Dr. Arduino's uh, most recent PhD student actually has um, a predictive equation that could be used in the future. So all we'd have to know is uh, the values of everything, uh, actually, no, the values of everything but one and you could, the values of DR and you could find everything else. So yeah, um, I'd really, really like to highlight uh, the contributions of Dr. Uh, Akash Satish and Dr. Song Ri uh, for their time and investment in my project. Um, this project is as much theirs as it is mine. Um, I also really like to thank Dr. Arduino at the uh, University of Washington for providing guidance and scripts and uh, taking time out of his busy schedule to help me with this project. Um, and lastly, to Dr. Matt uh, Schotler at the Sim Center for his guidance and all his logistical help, and to uh, uh, Robin for her help throughout the program as well. These are my references. Yep. And I'll open the floor to any questions. Yes, ma'am.
Yeah. I was just wondering the versus indicator, um, why below the standard like what's the resonance of the surface indicator? Like, I'm thinking that's the surface The blue line yeah. with the triangle. So that's the height of the water table. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like I said, yeah, liquefaction occurs in saturated soil. So that layer is below the water table. Yeah. So that's can all that's can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, so the, the question was uh, basically what is that blue line with the triangle on the soil column model? And I was just explaining to Claire that it's the uh, water level um, in that soil column. And because liquefaction occurs in saturated soil, um, the liquefiable layer is going to be below that uh, water level. Anything else? All right, thanks, guys. Uh, there's a question uh, on this side of the room, if that's okay. Yeah, thank you. What was the hardest part of your project for this summer? <laughs> so so you, so uh, the hardest part. So it would be probably, I had to learn Python um, completely from scratch in 10 weeks. And I'm by no means a coding genius. So that took a long time to learn. And I'm still learning it. And I had to get kind of baby through that. Um, <laughs> with my postdocs helping me a lot um, and using GitHub. Uh, I don't know if anyone else had to use that, but that was tough too. Uh, it was pretty touchy and trying to keep updating the code so that, you know, these uh, results could be reproducible is a little difficult. Yeah. All right, sounds good, thanks. Yep, thank you. Yeah, go for it, Chelsea. No, no, you're good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I don't know them off the top of my head because there's 22. So there's NB, ND. It's usually mostly saturated. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm not sure that could be a parameter. I don't remember that being a parameter. Yeah. No, 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 that's a big part. I don't know, to be quite honest. Yeah, no, 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 you're good. It's because the other variable, the other parameters have default values that most people do. Even the manual calibration that I keep mentioning that uh, Dr. Boulanger did at uh, UC Davis, he just kept those default values. And that's what we did too. And we just varied those two, our three parameters. Yeah, yeah if, I, if I knew, I would definitely let you know. I don't know though. Yeah, <laughs> good question. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Yeah, um, so it would because liquefaction occurs mostly in loose soils um, because they tend to uh, dilate or you know increase in volume as the water goes in between grains. So yeah, that would I think that would theoretically yeah reduce the risk of liquefaction. You can't do that all the time though. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Uh, no, we just assume that it's loose loose soil. Yep. All right, thank you. Appreciate it.